first area in Great Britain to be designated an area of outstanding natural beauty. The peninsula lingers 18 miles into the Atlantic, with the infamous Bristol Channel on its south flank, and varying in width from 4 to 8 miles. As John Wesley, the founder Methodist minister, commented in his journal of July 1764, Gower is a large tract of land bounded by Brecknockshire on the northeast, the sea on the southwest, and rivers on the other sides. Here, here, all the people talk English and are in general the most plain, loving people in Wales. The climate around Gower is extremely mild and long spells of cold weather are rare, but because of the prevailing southerly and southwesterly winds from the Atlantic, attracted by the Welsh hills, the humidity is higher than average. However, this information and more can be found in most textbooks, so let us concern ourselves with the real heart of Gower, an area unique in flora, fauna, and steeped in history and legends. Our first visit will be to the now enlarged villages of Merton and Bishopston. The Welsh name for Bishopston is Llandailo Verwallt, meaning the church or holy place of St. Tylo at the top of the wooded valley near the bubbling brook. This, of course, refers to the Bishopston Valley. And the Creighton, an underground stream which overflows after heavy rains and rushes down the usual, usually dry bed to the stream opposite the church. Bishopston, Bishopstown, has its derivation in formerly belonging to the Bishop of Llandaff, who held the manor in free arms. Bishopston remained as an episcopal manor of the bishop until the disestablishment of the church in 1920. Bishopston Church is dedicated to St. Tylo and has a long history, and the Welsh name, Llandailo Verwallt, has already been explained. According to the Liber Landarensis, the Book of Llandaff, it dates the church to about AD 480 to 490. The papal bull settling the patronage of the church in Llandaff was given in the year A.D. 1130 and remained with the Bishop of Llandaff until 1920. The church still keeps its map sent to St. Tylo on the 9th of February each year. The tower is embattled with a small pyramidal roof rising within and houses two bells dated 1713 and 1714 and weighing six and four hundredweight respectively. The present construction would seem to date it as Norman, late 12th or early 13th century. The south porch, however, is a fairly modern addition, being built in 1851, the door of which is solid oak. Two memorials are to be found in the nave. One on the south wall is a mem memorial tablet to Ivor James, the first registrar of the University of Wales and to his family. The second memorial on the north wall is to the memory of Lance Corporal Stephen Jones of Oldway Bishopston, who died at Heilbronn, South Africa, on the 26th of February 1902, while still on active service as a member of the Imperial Yeomanry. On the south wall of the chancel, there is a mural tablet erected in memory of Edward Davis, rector of the parish for 25 years and author of Celtic Researches, the mythology and rites of the ancient Druid and others born in 1756, and died in 1831. It is interesting to note that although the parish registers began in 1716, unlike some other parish registers, which contain interesting notes on major occurrences in the district, they are plain records of baptisms, marriages and burials. The church possesses copies of the bishop's transcripts of the parish registers, the earliest manuscript copy being dated 1671. Several famous people have been buried in the churchyard, including Isaac Heyman, correspondent in Gower to the famous Edward Lloyd. The village recently has expanded rapidly and the housing estates of West Cross just across the common towards Mumbles is slowly encroaching upon Merton, the little village on the south side of Bishopston. However, with the still open commons of Klein and Bishopston, there is still the feeling of open free country with splendid panoramic views. From the corner of the main road through, through the road of Bishopston, known as Pyle Corner, there is a narrow lane that leads you to the coast and to Brandy Cove. Although mainly pebbles and, and a rocky beach area, there is a little strip of sand when the tide is low and is a very secluded beach. 
This cove was originally known as Hairslade, which is just above Brandy Cove, but the name was changed during the Napoleonic Wars when smuggling was popular, especially brandy. This was a popular rendezvous for those famous families of the Arthurs, well-known Gower smugglers, and who lived not far from here at Highway, Pennard. In earlier days, lead was mined at Brandy Cove. Now it is popular with local residents and a few regular holidaymakers as a, as a haven of retreat. There is a magnificent walk awaiting the dedicated walker, and that is the walk through Bishopton Valley. The valley is reached by passing the church of St. Tylo and following the usually dried up riverbed of the partly underground stream of the Cretan and the Bishop's and Pill. The walk leads down eventually to the Bay of Pushti and is surrounded on both sides by outcrops of limestone covered in trees and vegetation. The walker will encounter many obstacles on his journey, such as fallen trees and occasional thick growths of vegetation, and on wandering off the path, will encounter large gaping holes on the surface of great depth where many a sheep has fallen. On the south side of the valley, about halfway down, is a small cave. This was the old lead mine where horseshoe bats are found in abundance. Not too far away, on the opposite side of the valley, is a small cave system which was popular at one time with local potholers but apt to flooding on occasions. Bishopston Valley eventually opens out into a magnificent pebbled beach, Pushti, or Black Pool, and the pool is there formed by the Bishopston Stream, dammed back by the, uh, by the huge number of pebbles. Pushti Head, 97 metres, is a massive face of limestone scarred with long parallel trenches, or slides, as they were called, when the area was quarried. The limestone blocks would be slid down on wooden sledges to the beach to await transportation by sailboat or limestone tars, as they were known, and shipped to Devon. A common expression used for these types of quarries in the old days was float cars. Not far from here is an area known as Gravesend, and with it, a reminder of the days of the press gangs, when a ship containing between 70 and 80 of the Navy's victims was wrecked near here. The vessel was the Admiralty tender, the Caesar, possibly a hired cutter, and left Swansea bound for Plymouth on the 28th of November, 1760, with Lieutenant James Cobrian as the commanding officer, who was in possession of a press warrant. It is believed that approximately 80 pressed men were either tied to timbers or shut down below. Latimer Davis, in his book Pennard and West Gower, suggests that the men were handcuffed and the hatches battened down. The vessel left Swansea Bay on a spring tide, but the weather deteriorated and the tide began to run out fast, and so the vessel eventually turned about. Later, they observed through a fading light a piece of land and assumed that it was Mumble's head. Mumble's lighthouse was not erected until 1795. In fact, the headland was Pushti, probably assuming Pushti was Oxwich Point. By now it was dark, and breakers were seen a short distance away. The crew tried to bring the stern around, but it was too late, and she bore straight into the rocks and stuck fast, and was at the mercy of the rising tide. The vessel had eventually grounded in a spot which forms part of Pushti Head, known today as Caesar's Hole. Some survivors managed to scramble ashore over the dangerous protruding rocks and found their way to High Pennard. The local people knew nothing of the incident until the following morning, when they found the remains of the vessel breaking up on the rocks and the number of bodies that were being washed ashore. Apparently there was the usual wreck pilfering, the number of bodies seems to vary from 68 to 97. However, they were all eventually buried in the nearest earth-covered area to Caesar's Hole towards Pushti Bay, known today, of course, as Gravesend. Two dwelling houses are found at Pushti, surprisingly. A visitor might think on observing the sheer inaccessibility of, of the, the bay. The building nearest the beach on the Pebble Line is the old Beaufort Inn, now a renovated private house while to the rear is another modernised private house. But not too long ago was a small shop, the Ship Cottage, run by an elderly lady. 
Many a time I've called in there for a refreshing cordial drink, made, incidentally, from the waters of Bishop's and Valley Stream. You may credule at this fact by using this water these days, but then as a student after a long slog down the valley on a hot summer's day, that cordial was like nectar. I would not, however, recommend to partake of the waters these days. These two buildings are the remaining evidence of a once bustling quarry area where it was said that many inns were situated to help alleviate the thirst of the hard-working quarrymen and the boat handlers. Indeed, apart from the Beaufort and Ship Inn, other inns existed such as the Bull and the New Inn and possibly more. On returning up Bishopson Valley and passing once more the Church of St. Tylo, we come upon the main Bishopson Pennard Road, which leads in a large semicircle uphill towards the village of Kittle. Where the road curves, a quarry can be seen on the north side. This is Barland Quarry, where large amounts of limestone are extracted. Nearby is Barland Common, where remains of the old Barland Castle, Mott and Bailey type, may be just visible as mounds in the soil. Kittle Village consists mainly of the main Pennard Road with a few shops, supplying everything from postcards to lawn mowers, and a public house, the Beaufort Arms, a 17th century inn. A number of houses have grown up around Kittle, but there is still a good view overlooking Bishopson Valley from the little village green known as Kittle Green and owned by the National Trust. Continuation of the main road leads to the minor crossroads of Pennard. A left turn leads down a narrow lane to Widegate and ultimately to Bishopson Valley while a right turn takes the visitor to link up with the main South Gower Road and on to Park Mill. At these crossroads is Pennard Church, the Church of St Mary, and is in fact the second to be built, the original being built on the cliffs near Pennard Castle. Unfortunately, the great sandstorms in medieval times encroached upon the village and buried it. We know, however, that the original church was standing in 1291. The church you see today is of the castellated tower type and built of local stone, probably from the old church itself, and has a large wooden beam supporting the gallery, which was also brought from the old church. Pennard Church was greatly restored in the 19th century by Thomas Penrice of Kilbrew, and the barrel organ, which apparently was a centre of attraction at one time, is now in St Fagan's Folk Museum near Cardiff. Passing the Church of St Mary and leading towards Pennard itself, two buildings are passed on the south side of the road, these being Great and Little Highway, now modernised dwelling houses, but at one time the home for the successful business of certain smugglers in the 18th century. Eventually, the road opens out on, in, onto Pennard Common and the golf course and access to the remains of an interesting antiquity in Gower, Pennard Castle. The castle is situated on the edge of Pennard Golf Course on the cliffs in a most impressive position overlooking the valley and it was here that the first discovery of the rare yellow Whitlow grass, Draba azoides, was made, which is confined to Gower. Pennard Castle is one of the mysteries of Gower as not much is recorded in Gower's past records. It is thought to have been built in the late 13th century and lived in for only a short time while in 1317, William de Breos gave the, the hunting rights of the area away and not long after rid himself of the manor entirely. There is an old tale that the castle was built on the site of a stronghold of Danish rovers, highly possible if we recall the Danish invasion in the 9th century. What is slightly more hard to swallow, but I have an open mind, is the tale that the castle was built in a single night by a Welsh sorcerer to save himself from the Normans threatening to kill him. Whether he was killed or not, we do not know, but I am sure a man that can build a fair-sized castle in one night can certainly escape the Normans' threats. However, if we try to regain our facts, the castle consists of two twin D-shaped gate towers and a single gate archway. Although the curtain wall on the northern side is mainly intact, the wall on the southern side has collapsed, some of it in 1961, and some repairs were later carried out by the Ministry of Public Buildings and Works, now the Department of Environment, with funds raised by the Gower Society, the golf club owners, and public appeal. Also in 1961, a Mr. Leslie Alcock 
carried out excavations on the site and revealed remains of stone walls of the hall of the castle, containing two service rooms, communal hall and a private retiring room. The remains were reburied to prevent further weather damage. The castle was rarely mentioned in any historical documents, but the survey of 1650 remarked that it was a desolate and ruinous place. It is thought that the castle was gradually encroached by the sand, especially during the succession of furious gales in the 14th and 15th centuries, and with the great sandstorm of 1607 was completely overwhelmed, as was the town and castle of Kenvig in Midlamorgan. The sand seemed to have begun stabilisation after this finale of sandstorms. Obviously, there are a few tales and legends associated with Pennard Castle and its vague past history, and the most well-known is the chief who lived in the castle and loved fighting. It is said that he aided a Welsh ruler who needed assistance in a battle. After winning the said battle, the chief was offered a reward and asked for the hand of the ruler's daughter in marriage. This, of course, could not be refused, and on returning to Pennard, a great feast was prepared, and eventually all the soldiers were drunk, and everyone was dancing and singing. The legend goes on to narrate that a sentry on the castle walls heard strange sounds, and looking over the valley, he saw a green spot on the grass, with a flickering circle of light and something moving within. He could not make this out, but it frightened him, and he stumbled down to the warden of the castle, who also happened to be in a drunken stupor. However, on reaching the castle walls and looking down, neither could make out exactly what this strange phenomenon was, so they ran to the hall to inform the chief. Thinking that this might be a chance and excuse for another battle with trespassers, he immediately summoned his men to arms and, fighting drunk, ran down the slope from the castle. As they approached the grassy area, they saw a group of fairies, lit up by a moonbeam, dancing and singing. The warriors burst into the circle of fairies, cutting and thrusting with their swords. But of course the creatures could only be seen and not touched, and the frustrated chief hurled himself amongst them, whirling his sword. Suddenly from the air a low, resonant voice sounded. Poor chief, thou warest against those that shall destroy thee. Thou hast wantonly spoiled our innocent sport, and for that thy castle and township shall be destroyed. The fairies then vanished. The moon went in, and it became very cold. Suddenly clouds of sands came swirling up the valley from the sea, filling the warriors' eyes, mouths and ears. The force of the gale sent sand piling over roofs of the houses and against the castle walls, so much that it burst the walls. In a few hours, castle, huts and houses were ruined and buried. Even old Pennard Church, which was near to hand, was buried in this manner. It is also said that a whole mountain of sand in Ireland had suddenly and mysteriously disappeared over the same night. A castle with the aura of mystery, such as that of Pennard, is bound to have a ghost, and not to disappoint anybody with spirit interests, there is a well-known tale of a spectre that haunts the castle. It is said that the Kraha Ribbin wanders around the castle and is supposedly to have been seen as late as the 19th century. This spectre resembles the Irish Banshee, a night hag. The ghost form has long black hair, sunken piercing eyes, or reputed to be of different colours, grey and black, with crooked with a crooked back and a thin figure. Her pigeon-breasted bust is concealed by a dark scarf and wears black trailing robes and sometimes seen with flapping wings and reputed to go flying around mansions at nightfall. Not a pleasant sight at the best of times. Apparently there is a story that anyone who slept in the castle was bewitched and one man who slept there in the past was found in the morning unconscious. On recovering consciousness, he described the above-mentioned hag, who clawed like an eagle and peaked his body. The man was said to be raving mad thereafter. I should think that most people would be slightly eccentric, to say the least, after suffering that experience. I know personally a few people who have slept in the grounds of the castle over the last 20 years, and although some may be a little eccentric in their ways, they've never mentioned sighting this spectre. 
Returning to the main road and Pennard Golf Club leads to the village of Southgate and eventually to Pennard Cliffs National Trust. A large car park may be found at the summit of these cliffs where breathtaking views over the Bristol Channel are experienced. From here are a choice of walks, eastwards in Hunts Bay and eventually back to Pulchdi, while westwards Pobbles and Three Cliffs Bay. Hunts Bay is not really a bay in the sense like many other sandy bays in Gower, for even when the tide is right out, hardly any sand exists and consists main of mainly rock, a beautiful bay nonetheless. High above Hunts Bay on the cliff tops is Hunts Farm, and tradition has it that this farm was given by William de Breos when Lord of Gower in the 13th century to his huntsman, hence the name today. Along the cliffs nearby can be found two of the most famous caves in Gower, that of Bacon and Minchin, or Minchin Hole, in which a variety of remains of extinct animals have been found. Bacon Hole Cave has been excavated on numerous occasions, uncovering a variety of animal remains, including the extinct straight-tusked elephant, soft-nosed rhinoceros, giant ox, bison and reindeer, bones of wolf and hyena have also been found. Found, too, was a bowl of the Paleolithic Age, proving early man lived in the region. To the rear of the cave is a dark recess, partia partially blocked by remains of an iron-barred screen, which was once part of a gate to prevent vandalism. It was here in 1912, several horizontal bands of dark red colour were discovered on one of the walls, bringing high hopes that Gower might show the only example in Britain of cave painting similar to that of the French caves, containing paintings of the Stone Age men. An expert in this field, Abbe Bayview, was called in and gave qualified ju judgment that these ray red marks may well have been made by early man. Unfortunately, over the years, his theory was discredited as the markings slowly changed shape and it was thought that the coloured areas were natural due to minerals seeping from the rock. On towards Pennard from Bacon is Minchin Hole, the largest of the bone caves in Gower. Minchin was originally excavated in the 19th century by Colonel Wood of Stout Hall and in more recent years by Mr Rutter, former curator of archaeology at Swansea Museum. Bones of wolf, hyena and bison were found, along with bones of lion, bison and remains of soft-nosed rhinoceros and straight-tusked elephant. It is believed that Minchin provided a place of refuge for individuals in the Dark Ages during unsettled times. Taking the westerly cliff walk from Pennard, passing the popular Heatherslade restaurant on the cliff tops, brings you eventually to overlook that magnificent spread of rock on the sandy bay below, known as Three Cliffs. The actual Three Cliffs are composed of three linked and pointed limestone cliffs with a wide arch and is very popular with rock climbers. Just before Three Cliffs Bay is a little storm beach known as Pobbles, and in the distance can be seen the headland of Oxwich Point. Three Cliffs Bay, however magnificent, is treacherous for bathers, with Pennard Pill flowing out nearby and the formation of the cliffs causing swirling currents. In the summer months, a voluntary lifeguard patrol are usually on hand, but care and precaution are needed if swimming in this bay. A marvellous walk can be experienced by trekking up through the burrows from Three Cliffs following the river Pennard Pill with Pennard Castle perched high up on the cliff edge, you eventually arrive at Park Mill. Park Mill is considered one of the main central meeting places of Gower, especially the Gower Inn Public House. As a writer in 1861 commented, the resting place is a neat and pleasant inn, the Gower Inn, where good sitting and sleeping rooms may be obtained. Although there are no longer sleeping rooms available, it is still a pleasant, modernised stone-fronted inn to stop a while and consume a refreshing pint of ale. There is a magnificent walk commencing behind this inn, and that is Ilston Coombe, or Valley, with a stream locally known as the Killy Willy, running and twisting the length of the steep-wooded side of the Coombe, with the open fields in between. On walking up the valley, under the woods at Trinity Well, you come across the foundations of the First Baptist Church in Wales, and built on the site of the medieval, medieval chapel of Trinity Well. 
A simple stone memorial pulpit stands on these ruins in the form of an open stone Bible which commemorates John Miles, once rector of Ilston, reading as follows. To commemorate the foundation in this valley of the First Baptist Church in Wales, 1649 to 1660, and to honour the memory of its founder, John Miles. This ruin is the site of the Pre-Reformation Chapel of Trinity Well, the 18th of July, 1928. John Miles was born in 1621 in Newton, Herefordshire. At the age of 15, he entered Oxford University at Brasenose College. He lost his living under Charles I for refusing to read the Book of Sports from the pulpit as commanded under the law of James I. A passage of the above book is as follows. As for our good people's recreation, our pleasure is that after the end of divine service, our good people be not let it, disturbed or discouraged from any law for recreation, such as dancing, either man or woman, archery for men, leaping, vaulting, or any such harmless recreation, or from having maples, wits and ales, or morris dances, and the setting up of maypoles and other sports there with used. At the restoration of Charles II, John Miles and his followers emigrated to America, and in 1663 founded a Baptist chapel in Swansea, Massachusetts. From the ruins, follow the track to the secluded little village of Ilston, or detour slightly to Courthouse Farm, to a lane deep between banks of an ancient trackway. The track comes out near Ilston Church, dedicated to St Ictid, one of the great 6th century Celtic saints. There is a small disused quarry at Ilston of some geological importance, showing a rare example of limestone alternating with beds of clay and containing fossil sea lilies with lead ore. It is interesting to note that a whole hoard of Roman coins were found there in 1933 when the quarry was working. This quarry is now under the care of the Glamorgan Naturalist Trust as a local nature reserve. The Trust have tried in the past to speed up the natural processes of plant activity by planting in order to provide cover, etc., for birds such as kestrels. The central feature of the quarry is a pool containing plants such as greater water plantain and a few species of freshwater fish, which in turn attracts birds such as kingfishers, grey wagtails and dippers. <coughs> Ilston Church is situated hidden away in a corner of secluded Ilston surrounded by trees. In fact, one tree, a yew tree, is reputed to be as old as the present church. It was in fact common to plant a yew tree in the churchyard upon completing of the building. The church is St Ilchtid's, one of the great 6th century saints to the centre of Llantwit Major, Llan Ilchtid Vaul. Tradition claims that his home was Caldy, and in the 16th century there was a small Christian cell on this site. In the papal bulls of 1128 to 1129, the church is called Llan Canwalon, the church of St Canwalon, although nothing is known of this saint, and he was probably a student of St Ilchtid. On the arrival of the Normans, Ilston, as with other churches except St Tylo's at Bishopston, became part of the Diocese of St David's. In 1221, the patronage of the church was handed to the Knights of St John of Jerusalem, who, it is thought, replaced the earlier Celtic church and built the pre present church tower. On the dissolution of the monasteries, the order of St John was suspended and the patronage of the church passed to the Crown, who administered it until 1865. In 1891, the parish of Pennard was combined with Ilston, and in 1925, the old rectory above the church was sold, while the parish priests lived in the new vicarage in Pennard next to the church. In 1923, the Diocese of Swansea and Brecon was formed, and Ilster came under that diocese. From the parish records, there was a school attached to the church in the 18th century, and when the building fell into a ruinous state, the stones were used to rebuild the churchyard wall. The roof is the usual saddleback type and is at right angles to the nave, and the oldest part of the church standing now is the embattled tower. In 1776, two bells were brought into the church, made by an oystermouth firm, Davis, and inscribed with the names of Evan Jones, Rector, and Thomas Bowen, Church Warden. 
In addition to these two bells, there is a pre-Reformation bell, which is in the nave of the church, and bears the inscription, Scante Toma Ora Pro Nobis, St. Thomas, pray for us, presumably Thomas a Becket. The bell was cast by the Jeffreys, a Bristol family of iron founders, circa 1520. Park Mill possesses a further interesting walk at the west end of the village, where a ford will have to be negotiated just beyond the village shop. Passing the building of the water-operated corn mill, mill towards the pumping station, a narrow lane leads through an avenue of trees to the building known as Park Lebreos, now a pony pack trekking centre, and once part of the estate of William de Breos, a Norman Lord of Gower. He was grandson to the William de Breos, Lord of Abergavenny in the 12th century, who murdered a Prince of Gwent, Sysicht, his follow followers, Sysicht's wife and baby son. William de Breos of Gower was hung from an oak tree, where we do not know, but legend informs us that he was buried in Cae Gwilym the Black William's Field, not far from Park Lebreos. Up the valley is the area known as Green Cum, once part of a hunting park of the Norman Lords of Debreos. It is here that a remarkably well-preserved long chamber tomb may be found. This is a megalithic tomb, approximately 2500 BC, and is known by various names such as the Giant Grave, Park Lebreos Tomb, or Park Cum Long Cairn. It was first excavated by Lord Avebury in 1869, where the remains of 24 individuals were found, along with fragments of pottery and a few animal bones. The chamber is said to represent most of the classical features of the seven Cotswold group of the Neolithic period, consisting of a wedge-shaped cairn, a bell-shaped forecourt of local stone, all of which are around a central gallery with four side chambers. It was fully examined in 1960-61 and renovated by the Department of Environment. Not far from Giant's Grave, on a steep slope on the eastern side of the valley, is a rock face where, among the trees, is a small cave known as Cat Hole. The cave itself is fronted by an open platform, which is rather broken up owing to recent unfilled excavations. A large amount of flint blades were discovered in the excavations of 1968 and said to be of the Cresswellian type, approximately 1200 BC. To carry on to the northerly tip of the valley would bring you to a little hamlet of Llethrid, situated in a dip on the main North Gower Road. Llethrid has a rather interesting large cave system where vast limestone caverns are found, full of well-formed stalagmites and stalactites. The entrance to Clethrid Swallet, as it was known, is not far from the old lodge house at Clethrid, but the caves are rather dangerous, and at one time access was under supervision of the South Wales Caving Club. Like Bishopston Valley, the main part of the stream system in Parkmill Valley runs underground from Clethrid North to Parkmill itself, where it comes out at the pumping station. Before leaving the Park Mill area, a mention must be made of the interesting buildings and manor house of Kilru. Kilru Manor is situated at the top of the main hill that runs down to the Gower Inn, and is surrounded on the roadside by a high stone wall which looks as though it would collapse on the intrepid traveller any moment. The original manor house was built by Roland Dawkins in 1585. The Dawkins held Kilfru until 1820, when the daughter of William Dawkin, last of the line, sold the estate to Thomas Penrice. It was Thomas Penrice of Yarmouth who built the Gower Inn in Park Mill in the 18th century. Thomas died in 1846 and was buried at Pennard Church, whereupon his estate passed to his nephew, also named Thomas Penrice. This nephew died in 1897 and Kilru passed to his eldest daughter Louisa, wife of Admiral Sir Algernon MacLenna Lyons. The owner of Kilru Manor held manorial rights of the old Norman manor of Pennard, Fairwood Common, Pennard Cliffs and Barrows, and the tenant of the said areas used to attend the court lee of the manor held annually at the Gower Inn. The rent for these areas were collected every six months, also at the Gower Inn. 
Returning to our Admiral, he invested capital in Germany and apparently lost all before 1914 and had died, so Kilbrew could not be maintained as, as such. To avoid heavy death duties, the estate was passed over to the eldest son in 1911, Thomas Humphrey Lyons. Thomas, however, died during an influenza epi epidemic in 1918, and the estate had to be sold to cover the death duties. The estate consisted of land from Push D and Three Cliffs right over to Three Crosses, North Gower. The first sale of this land was held at the then Hotel Cameron, Swansea, in 1919, while a second sale was held <clears throat> the following year in 1920. Kilvrew has had several owners over the past few years, but now, like Stout Hall near Reynoldston, is an outdoor education centre, but run by Oxfordshire Education Committee. Our next village westwards from Park Mill is Penmain, meaning stone head or top, situated on the eastern edge of Kevin Bryn, and consists mainly of scattered dwellings along the main south road. The church, dedicated to St John the Baptist, is situated set back from the green and has been greatly restored. Passing the church and going up the little lane to the edge of Kevin Bryn, you will notice a large white building commanding some fine views across the channel. This is Glanamore, the old people's home. From here, it's possible to attempt that fine ridge walk with fantastic views over Kevin Bryn and across to King Arthur's Stone, Mine Ketty, a burial chamber. Pen Main or Pen Mine Burrows is an interesting area and is reached by going on to the main road and travelling west through Pen Main itself, arriving at a small car park on the seaward side. From here, a gated track leads you to Pen Main Burrows, an area of sand dunes, coarse grass, and marram. It was said that a village by the name of Stead Wolango was buried here in the 14th century. Indeed, the remains of the sand-buried Penmain Old Church stand among the dunes not far from where the lane comes out onto the dunes. Whether the village existed or not, for the time we shall not know. All that remains of the church now is a stone wall depression in the dunes of which the nave and chancel can be made out. Not far from these ruins is an even older remains of an interesting nature, Penmain Megalithic Tomb, or Penagrig, the top hillock or tumulus. Estimated to be about 4,500 years old, it is a good example of a communal to tomb. Visible are the remains of an entrance passage and one remaining side chamber which was covered by a massive capstone said to weigh approximately seven tons. When first excavated in 1893, human and animal remains were found together with fragments of pottery. On the cliff edge overlooking Three Cliffs Bay is Penmain Old Castle, a 12th century Norman defensive consisting of a massive circular stone bank fronted by a deep ditch. It is thought to have been built in the 12th century and consisted of a massive encircling bank of limestone rubble with a deep rock-cut ditch in front. The area was excavated in 1960-61 to by a Mr Leslie Alcock and revealed traces of a large timber gate tower which apparently had been destroyed by an intense fire. Following this destruction, the entrance was made narrower and a large but crude stone hall built on the seaward side of the site. The tower was not rebuilt. Because the site was not abandoned until sometime just before the mid-13th century, it was not concealed by a later stone castle as with so many other castles in Gower. The ditch and ramparts can be just made out today. Following the cliff edge westwards from Penmain Burrows, you arrive at Great Tor, a large spur of cliff formed by vertical limestone separating three cliffs from the larger sweep of Oxwich Bay, although on spring tides the two are joined in one long arc of sand. Situated high up on the east side of the, of the Camel's Hump, behind the Great Tor, is one of Gower's most inaccessible cove caves, Leather's Hole. It may be observed by carefully traversing northwards from the north path high up on the Great Tor, and great care is needed here in scrambling down the cliff. The cave commands fantastic views over the coast and consists of a passage penetrating deep into the rock 
ending in a low tunnel which has to be negotiated by crawling. Once through the tunnel, you arrive in a roomy passage deep in the limestone tor. As Isaac Heyman stated in one of his surveys of Gower, In this parish, near the sea, standeth a very high steep rock like a tower, in it a large cave called Glather Hole, in which cave in former time, as reported, was the working and lodging place of robbers and clipper coiners. Sooner them than me. Excavations in the last century recovered bones of mammoth, woolly rhinoceros, wolf and hyena. Although this cave would have been more accessible in the later stage of the glacial age, it is thought that mammoth and similar mammals could not have entered while alive. Logically, we can assume that this was therefore once a hyena's den, where the carnivores would drag in the remains of other animals for food. Westwards from the Great Tor is the wide expanse of Oxwich Bay. Walking down towards the beach area and passing the dune systems of Nicholson Burrows, you come to a stream running out onto the sands known as Nicholson Pill, which flows from Oxwich Marshes. In these dunes are a considerable number of plant species such as caper, spurge and spring whitlow grass. Following Nicholson Pill inland, you arrive on the edge of Nicholson Woods, partly managed by the Nature Conservancy Council. A variety of nesting birds are to be seen and heard in these woods, the most common being wrens and blackbirds, but goldfinch crests may also be observed often. Other birds include chaffinch, blue tits, chiffchaff, and our old friend the robin. The larger birds include sparrowhawk, kestrel and cuckoo, but apparently have lived outside the woods in the past. Eastwards of Nicholson Woods is Crawley Woods, where among the tangle of vegetation is the remains of the medieval ruins of Old Nicholson Church, another building yet again buried by the encroaching sands. You are now but a few minutes' walk away from Nicholson Cross and Village, a scattering of houses and farms. The church is situated on the seaward side of the main South Gower Road and is isolated from the village. At one time, Nicholson Church, next to Llanmadoc, was the smallest in Gower. The Victorians, however, completed their usual lavish restoration in 1894, with the result, it was said, then to be the most elaborately treated ecclesiastical building in Wales, if not the West. Continuing westwards on the main road, you come to a curve in the road with a pe peculiar-looking castle-type building. This is known as Oxwich Towers. Oxwich Towers is an 18th-century folly built by the squire of Penrice, Thomas Mansell Talbot, 1747 to 1813, and according to Henry Skyne, a literary traveller, were fictitious fragments of a modern ruin. Penrice, or Penrice, was one of the original fees in the days of the Norman Conquest, while in the 12th century it was in the possession of Sir Robert de Penrice. After the death of Sir John de Penrice in the 15th century, the estate, including Oxwich, passed to daughter Isabel de Penrice, who married into the Mansell family, Sir Hugh Mansell. We know that Sir Rice Mansell was at Penrice between 1487 to 1557. Penrice remained in the Mansell family until the 18th century, when Mary, daughter of Thomas, first Lord Mansell, married the Reverend Thomas Talbot of Laycock, Abbey, Wiltshire. The estates passed to the Talbots in 1750 and the family were known as the Mansell Talbots. The Reverend Mansell Talbot died in 1758 leaving a son, Thomas Mansell Talbot, to carry on the estate. Thomas Mansell Talbot commissioned the architect Anthony Keck to design this mansion, although much of Talbot's ideas were incorporated and building commenced in 1773. In 1779 it was completed, consisting of four storeys and made of bath stone. The interior was lavishly constructed, marble fireplaces imported from Italy, mahogany doors and furniture and sculpture from the continent. One of the main showpieces of the house is the collection of Dutch and Italian paintings, most of which were brought from Europe by Talbot when he made his grand tour in the early 1770s. Many of the paintings still hang in the house and are owned by the present owner-occupier, Christopher Methuen Campbell. 
The grounds were planted extensively with trees and shrubs, mainly from the nurseries at Margham Park Estate, belonging to Talbot, and planted mainly under the supervision of Lady Mary Talbot, as were the former flower gardens. Talbot created a large artificial lake, which in years to come attracted a number of herons, and today Penrice Heronry is well known. Thomas Mansell Talbot married relatively late in life at the age of 47, in 1794. He married 22-year-old Lady Mary Lucy Fox Strangeways, second daughter of Henry, 2nd Earl of Chichester, 1747 to 1802. There were eight children from the marriage, seven daughters and one son and heir, Christopher Rice Mansell Talbot, 1803 to 1890, born at Penrice Castle in 1803, later to become an even greater national figure than his father. Thomas Mansell Talbot died on the 14th of May, 1813 at Penrice, and part of his obituary in the Cambrian newspaper read as follows. On Monday were interred in the family vault at Margham the remains of Thomas Mansell Talbot, Esquire. He was most respectfully attended to the grave by a vast concourse of friends, tenantry and dependents. The bells of different churches tolled during the passing of the procession. The shipping in the harbours of Swansea, Neath and Aberavon hoisted their colours half-mast high and every possible token of the regard for the, rem the memory of the much-lamented gentleman was manifested by all ranks of people. May those who aspire to his honourable character imitate his amiable qualities, and may we, in the same family, see his like again. The widowed Lady Mary remarried in 1815 to a naval captain and Colonel of Marines, Sir Christopher Cole, KCB, who died himself aged 66 in 1836. Lady Mary died at her son's estate in Margham in 1855 at the age of 79 and was interred at Penrice Church with her second husband. Penrice village is now a small, quiet village comprising of a few houses and the Church of St Andrew but once was a social centre of Gower during the reign of that merry monarch Charles II. Market and fair days were popular with prize fighting probably outside the then public house, the King's Head. There's no public house today. The main fair was held in autumn, granted by charter by Charles II in 1664. Today all is quiet and the character of the village quite unchanged. On the green is a base of a cross with a pound nearby. And not too far away is a large Norman earthwork known as Old Penrice Castle, or popularly Mounty Bank. Penrice Old Castle, or Mountiebank, like Penmain, was not disturbed by the building of a later stone castle, and probably abandoned about the same time as Penmain when the first mortared stone castle of Penrice was built, not a mile away from this site. Penrice Old Castle is the biggest of the early ringworks in Gower, and has yet to be fully excavated. The site is very overgrown and easily missed by the passerby but on close observation, the extensive high defensive banks can clearly be seen indicating to a somewhat complex structure. The Norman Penrice Castle is the largest castle in Gower, but contains few buildings. It is flanked by two large towers, flat-sided with rounded corners. These were built in the latter part of the 13th century, along with the tall curtain wall and the long gable-ended building inside the castle itself. Attached to the small round keep of the three storeys, the oldest surviving part of the castle, circa 1240, can be seen with the remains of the hall, although rather overgrown with ivy these days. Standing proud of the curtain wall can be seen numerous small, solid, half-round bastions, and outside the southeast curtain wall, a well-preserved stone pigeon house, columbarium, can be found, thought to have been built <clears throat> about 1500. Penrice Church is set in the now quiet small village overlooking the village green where the base of the old village cross may be seen known as the crying stone because it was used by the village crier in the long days past. The church is dedicated to St Andrew and was mentioned like Landymore Old Church now extinct in the confirmation of Bishop Anselm in 1230 and shows that the church and land of Penrice were presented by Sir Robert de Penrice to the preceptory of Sleerbach in Pembrokeshire between 1176 and 1198. 
In the 14th century, 1330, the church was under the auspices of the Hospital of St David in Swansea, a house for aged priests and church laymen, now an inn, the Cross Keys, and the, old, and the oldest building in Swansea, built by Henry de Gower. In 1550, King Edward VI confiscated the endowments of St. David, Swansea, and leased them until James I. Apparently, no records were known of the church until 1720, when a great storm blew the roof away. At the end of the 19th century, the church was restored by the then owner of Penrice, Miss Talbot, at her own expense. The restoration involved mainly a new door from the porch to the nave and larger windows. The porch is exceptionally large for a Gower church and it is believed to have been used as a school in the 16th and 17th centuries. The chancel arch in the nave is of Saxon design and so is thought that the Normans employed a Saxon mason. The transept is believed to be originally a chantry chapel for the de Penrice family as a doorway, older than the arch, was found leading into the transept suggesting the transept was separated from the rest of the church. On the exterior are two arches of stone built into the wall, seemingly the entrance of the vaults under the church. The font of unknown age, probably 13th century, possibly earlier, was found in the churchyard repaired and placed in the church in 1920. The church bell is inscribed John Rudhall, Gloucester Sect, 1799. To the left of the porch is a murder stone, a memorial to a lady who was killed by a blow to the head, but the name of the murderer has been scratched out. It's also thought that the name of the murderer was left out as a lure to self-confess, or by a new witness coming forward. Not too far away from the village of Penrice is a steep hill known as Penny Hitch. A mill once worked here at the bottom of the hill, and from tra tradition, a man used to stand at the corner to hire out an extra horse for a penny to assist the carts up this steep hill. Before leaving Penrice and its, its estates, a mention of that great annual event of Gower, the Gower Show, which is held in the grounds of Penrice estate each year, and where people from all over visit and take part in sheepdog trials, horse and stallion parades and much more. The coastal village below Penrice is Oxwich, comprising mainly of sand dunes and marshes, which is now mainly a national nature reserve, and once the great estate of Penrice, part of which is leased by the Nature Conservancy Council from that estate. In 1770, Thomas Mansell Talbot, because of deteriorating land use, built an eight-foot-high seawall, excluding the sea from the inner marsh, improving 200 acres of land for grazing by sheep and cattle right into the 20th century. 542 acres are managed by the Nature Conservancy Council as a nat national nature reserve, consisting of freshwater lakes, swamps, marshes and salt marshes, dunes, cliffs and woodlands. It is a diverse habitat, rich in flora and fauna. Over 400 species of flowering plant plants and over 600 different species of diptera, two-winged flies. A large part of the marsh around the partly artificial lakes is reed swamps with tall reeds, phragmites waving in the wind and is distinct from the salt marsh. The freshwater inner marsh has its own unique community of flora and fauna, for example dragonflies and reed warblers. Oxwich burrows, included in the reserve, is similar to that of Whitford and Llangeneth burrows, a series of blown sand dunes. But before commencing a walkabout, it may be useful to visit the NCC's information centre in the main car park. This usually has on display many aspects of coastal preservation and exhibits of marine life, and usually has a warden on duty to assist any member of the public. As sand dunes are highly mobile and vulnerable to erosion, it is advisable to follow the well-marked paths put there by the Nature Conservancy Council. The car park merges onto the beach, which is popular with many tourists in the holiday season because of its easy access. The bathing is relatively safe and the Swansea City Council provides a professional lifeguard during the summer months. The depth of the bay is approximately only 10 metres and the seabed is park rock, 
part rock and part sand. The fringe of the seabed exposed at low tide consists of a rocky shore round Oxwich Point and a two-mile stretch of sand beach, providing habitats for a diverse number of marine life. The four dunes meeting the beach are known as embryo dunes and are usually bound together with sea couch grass. Plants on the beach or strand line are of the salt-resistant type, such as sea rocket and prickly saltwort, both of which can tolerate short immersions of salt water and help in the formation of dune building. Leaving the embryo dunes, a fascinating plant can sometimes be seen, sea holly, and grows well in the dunes because of its deep roots. A lovely purple-headed flower in the summer months, very attractive, but none too common. Unfortunately, all these dunes are liable to erosion by many factors, man and wind especially, and you may notice as you follow the marked route around, depressions or blowouts in the dunes. These have been hollowed out by the coastal winds. Below the high dune systems, there are known as dune slacks, and provide an interesting habitat for various plant and animal life, such as creeping willow, an important sand builder. One of the most important sand dune plants is marum, a deep-rooted plant helping to stabilize and fix the dunes. It has the advantage that on being buried under sand, it sends up new shoots to the surface, thus binding the sand together with the old shoots. On certain dunes, you may notice rows of neatly placed marum shoots. This is where the Nature Conservancy Council, assisted by the able-bodied volunteer group, the Conservation Corps, have planted marum to help the dunes build up. Other dune plants commonly seen include rest harrow, cellwort, and common century. Further landward, you arrived at the fixed older dunes, where the wind rarely penetrates and the marum is gradually replaced by many other plant species, including various types of moss, such as tortula, which is peculiar to dunes, a bright golden green when wet and a dull brown when dried out. Dewberry is a favourite plant of the dune systems. This is a form of bramble, similar to blackberry, but spreads along the ground and has, I think, a much more succulent flavour than a blackberry. While continuing on your route, you might possibly observe numerous empty snail shells and on a wet day many full ones. These, in turn, often attract thrushes and others. Before leaving this area of dunes, it might be a good idea to think just how important this vegetation really is, as without it, the nearby marshes and farmland would be seriously inundated by blown sand. Leaving Oxford dunes and passing the old stone buildings on the corner of the crossroads, which was once Oxford School, there faces you the steep hill of Gander Street. On the seaward side is Oxwich Woods and an interesting walk to Oxwich Point via Oxwood Church. Although near the bustling summer village in Sands, the church seems to stand apart, situated in a secluded, reverend part of Oxwich. Past the car park and through the little woods with a rocky foreshore on one side and Oxwich Woods on the other, the church can be found buried in overhanging trees. It is dedicated to St Ilted, a 6th century saint, and one of the three main teachers responsible for bringing Christianity into Gower. His monastery was that of Llantwit Major. The other two saints were St. Tylo and St. Cadoc of Llandaf and Llancarvon, respectively. St. Ilted lived for some time at Oystermouth, which was then known as Astimlwynarth, and popular in Roman days, possibly because of the then oyster industry. A Roman villa is thought to have been the site on which now stands Oystermouth Church. The foundations of Oxwich Church date to the 6th century, However, the building today was built between the 11th and 14th centuries, and the tower and nave are typical of the 13th century construction. The ancient font is reputed to have been placed in the church by St. Ilted himself. The chancel is very small, and has led to speculation that this might have been the original Celtic cell. Fixed on each side of the porch are two stone grave covers, once used as steps, and are inscribed in memory of the rectors of the church, one William de la Lake, rector 
1320 to 1323, while the other bears an incised cross and deciphered reads, Hugh, formerly pious rector of St. Ilfted Church, lies here, thought to be late 13th or early 14th century. On the north side of the chancel, lying in an arched recess, are two 14th century stone effigies of a knight and his lady, presumed to be one of the de la Mare family, who originally lived at Oxwich Castle. Robert de la Mare helped in the conquest of Gower. Also, the de la Mares lived in the old castle at Portainum. It is said that this knight and his lady were involved in a drowning tragedy in Oxwich Bay. Returning to the crossroads and up Gander Street leads you to Oxwich Castle, presently being restored by the Department of Environment. The present standing castle is a good example, Webley is another, of a 16th century fortified manor, when castles built entirely for defence were being replaced by more elaborate buildings, but still retaining some form of protection. About 1541, Sir Rice Mansell, soldier and crown officer, rebuilt the castle on the site of the earlier fortification in which he himself was born. There is a very impressive crested gateway, which in turn leads to a courtyard. This crest is in fact that of Sir Rice Mansell himself, 1487 to 1559, the last of his line of Mansells to live at the castle. It is under this gateway that the tragic death of Anne Mansell of Llanddewi, or Henllwy, occurred in December 1557. The story is well known in Gower and is told in the archives of the Star Chamber and related in length in the journey of the Gower Society, Gower Volume 2. But, of course, who can resist retelling these bygone da tales? And this one began with typically a shipwreck. A French ship had been wrecked in Oxwich Bay, and when a Sir George Herbert of Swansea, who had certain rights over wrecks along the coast, heard this news, he rode with haste with followers to claim the spoils. On his arrival, Sir George found that the cargo had been divided between the Mansells and others and hidden away. Sir George felt that he should have his fair share and went to Oxwich Castle to reason with the Mansells. Edward Mansell met him and became angry, Blows were struck, leading to a stone being thrown by one of Sir George's men into the Mansell crowd. Unfortunately, this struck Anne Mansell, who was only acting as an arbitrator. This, of course, immediately subdued the crowd. Anne Mansell subsequently died because of this incident, and Sir George was taken before the court of the Star Chamber and found guilty of charges in connection with the French cargo. Oxwich, like Penrice Castle, possessed a columbarium, pigeon house, and the stone remains may be observed near the castle itself, where it also may be noted are the remains of the earlier castle incorporated into the newer building. The family that lived in Oxwich Old Castle was the normal fam Norman family of the de la Mares in the 14th century. To continue along the little lane from Oxwich Castle, passing the green, brings the walker to a rapid halt and eastern slade where a path leads to a little cove, Slade. Slade in Gower usually refers to a cutting in the cliffs, and here are good views looking back towards Oxwich Point and paths westward to Horton. Back in Oxwich, by taking the main road through the village and passing the thatched cottages, is a little cottage where the founder Methodist minister John Wesley stayed. According to his journal, John Wesley first arrived in Gower on the 31st of July, 1764, by travelling across the estuary to Whitford Sands. He stayed in the street for a short while preaching, for there was no public house, until a woman gave him a house room, but she had nothing in the house but a dram of gin. Where she obtained the gin, we can only surmise, perhaps the wreck? John Wesley paid several visits to Oxwich over the next few years, and in a note of his journal for August 1768, he visited Oxwich Castle, where he stated the building is far the loftiest which I have seen in Wales. What a taste had they who removed from hence to bury themselves in the hole at Margham. Passing through Oxford Village itself eventually leads to a narrow crosswood roads westwards to Horton, while eastwards is to return to our little village of Penrice.
Following the lanes to Horton, then, we pass an old farm building known as Sanctuary, the foundations and records of which go back to 1400. It was then occupied by a David Crump, but apparently owned by the Order of St John. This was also the Bennett homestead for the Pitt Farm, David Bennett being married to Anne Lucas, and according to a tablet in Penmain Church, David Bennett died in 1666, aged 81. From Sanctuary Farm and Woods is a crossroads known as Hangman's Cross, otherwise lesser known as Cold Comfort, both names conjuring up shuddering visions of the past. There was indeed a gibbet erected here at one time, where, presumably, many a horse or sheep stealer met his fate. Leaving our imaginary horse stealer hanging, as it were, you arrive at Horton, a reasonably quiet sheltered seaside village situated at the eastern end of Fortinon Bay. Horton is where the widows of the infamous Lucas of Salthouse Fortinon moved on to the death of their husbands, of which more of them and their deeds later. Today, Horton has grown over the years to cater for an ever-increasing influx of visitors, but still considered more superior than her big sister Portainon, especially as Joseph Chamberlain and his family, including Neville Chamberlain, visited Horton for a holiday at one time. From this point, it might prove to be a good idea to abandon all thoughts of transport and explore this southern point on foot. A mere pebble's throw away from Horton Beach is the village of Portainon. It is said that the name of this village is taken from a Welsh prince of the 11th century who is reputed to have built the old castle of Portainon out near the point, of which, we, of which we know little, apart from the salt house building may have been sighted on its remains, if any. There is a fine stretch of sands at Portainon, and of course it's very popular with tourists in the season, many of whom are catered for in the camping fields behind the dunes. The village still retains its old character of the seafaring days, especially the public house, the ship, well worth a refreshing visit. The main industry trade in Portainon in the 19th century was oyster fishing and limestone quarrying. Limestone was shipped off to Devon and in fact remains on the headland to the west of the bay in the form of a wooden pile may be seen. This is where the ships docked between walls of stone until the tide retreated to be refloated on the flood loaded with stone. The village church is dedicated to St Catuk and holds a grim reminder of the savages of the sea in its churchyard, that of the white marbled lifeboatman commemorating the loss of life in a lifeboat tragedy in 1916. Walking westwards toward Portainon Point, with the small sand dunes on the land side, we initially come across a, a splendid little beach cottage, the surrounding walls of which have been covered in marine shells. This is, was at one time a boathouse and now has been converted into a holiday co cottage with the invigorating name of Suntan, and many a tan I required myself while spending many holidays there. Where else for a Gower boy to spend his holidays but in Gower? Next to Suntan is a building set slightly back and with the remains of a slipway descending from it onto the beach. Now this is a youth hostel, but at one time a lifeboat house. Of course, in those days of the 19th century, a lifeboat was of the rowing type and needed a tough and determined crew, of which there were many to be found in Portainon and district. While standing on the slipway looking out over the rock to the sea, you can imagine the old days of sail and wrecks. The area from Pushti to Worm's Head was a renowned treacherous spot with the Helwick Sands on the west of Portainon headland. It was reported in 1815 by the customs collector at Swansea that there had been more than 20 wrecks in the past 18 years in this area and that a lifeboat was urgently needed at Oxwich. On December the 17th, 1817, the same officer reported the loss with all hands of a French vessel at Portainon and reputed to be a smuggler. However, the main deciding factor in establishing a lifeboat at Portainon was the incident involving the ill-fated Agnes Jack. The incident occurred on the same night when Mumbles' lifeboat was assistin assisting the Admiral Prince Adalbert at, at Mumbles. Agnes Jack was a steamship of Liverpool carrying a cargo of lead ore bound for Llanelli from Swansea. But because of the bad weather, 
She had been sheltering in Swansea Bay and left on the evening of the 27th of February, 1883. However, she ran into a new formed westerly gale and took in large amounts of water, which eventually put her boilers out. She was driven ashore in the early hours of the morning of the 28th at low water near Portainon Point. It's not known where the signals of distress were made, but the wreck was not discovered until first light. By now, she apparently was closer to high water, and all that could be seen was a mast protruding from the sea, with 21 people, 20 crew, one passenger, clinging to it. The teams of the Oxwich and Rosilli rocket apparatus were quickly on the scene, but the lines proved too short to reach the, reach the wreck, and played a waiting game until low water. However, time was of the essence, and the force of the waves began breaking up the masts supporting shrouds, and eventually the mast snapped, flinging the survivors into the sea to be drowned or smashed to death on the rocks. It was all over in a few despairing minutes, and all the onlookers could do was to collect the bodies as they were washed ashore. All that remains of that day is a solemn-looking mass of metal, the ship's boiler, in between the rocks. After that disaster, it was decided to form a lifeboat station as soon as possible. On completion of the building, the first lifeboat was in installed, a daughter's offering, a self-writing 34-foot, 10-oared boat provided from a bequest of a thousand pounds from a Miss Mariah Jones of Liverpool. The inaugural launch took place on May the 10th, 1884. It was not until January the 13th, 1888, when the lifeboat saw its first service, and this was to assist the Hull steamship Milan, bound from Alexandria for Bristol with cotton seed. Owing to a heavy ground swell, the ship fell out onto rocks and began to break up. The lifeboat was launched in the early evening and took off 11 men, while the rest of the crew were saved by rocket line. This lifeboat, lifeboat saw several services, the last of which was on February the 25th, 1903, when a bark, the Norwegian Allegro, was seen drifting in heavy seas. In fact, she drifted right down the coast into Swansea Bay, and this was the furthest trip Portainon lifeboat ever made, staying overnight at Mumbles. In July 1906, a new 35-foot self-writing lifeboat was installed and was specially built to launch in the shallow foreshore of the bay, having a draft of only just over two foot. By now, the boathouse had been enlarged. The boat was named Janet, and she saw her first service on December the 22nd, 1909, in the form of a French steamship, Lutec, stranded at Southgate. The crew, the crew of the Janet also rescued the crew of 12 off the Manchester steamer Bluebell, which ran aground on the rocks at Culver Hole. The most well-known story in Janet's service life, of course, is the tragic event of January the 1st, 1916, when she was launched to aid the Glasgow steamship Dunregan, ashore at Oxwich. At the time, there were very heavy seas and a strong gale, and arriving at the scene of the lifeboat, crew had to stand off owing to the large breakers around the crippled ship. However, on the nearby Cliffland, rocket apparatus was being set up to assist the rescue, so the Janet made for home. Unfortunately, a succession of heavy seas struck the Janet, capsizing her twice, the crew being flung into the water. On a check, it was found that coxswain William Gibbs, second coxswain William Einan, and lifeboatman George Harry were missing. The crew turned about to search for the missing three, hoping their cork life jackets would keep the men on the surface, but with no luck. Captain George Einan took command, but because of the prevailing conditions made for mumbles, arriving in the early hours of the morning of the 2nd of January, after 20 hours at sea, as a result of this disaster, steps were taken to close the lifeboat station at Portainon, and the Janet was sent to Stornoway in the Hebrides. A marble memorial, as earlier described, was erected in the churchyard to commemorate bravery and devotion to duty. From the youth hostel past a row of cottages built up on a bank with steps at their front leading down into the beach is known as Crowder's Quay, where the oyster catchers were landed in the 19th century. 
Beyond Crowder's Quay are isolated ruins showing gable ends of a pair of cottages built in the late 18th century. These, in turn, were built on the ruins of the infamous Salt House home of the equally infamous Gower family, Lucas. Below the ruins is the remains of deep cellars belonging to the old Salt House, the first of which was built in the reign of Henry VIII, 1509, by David Lucas of Stoutwalls, now Stouthall, for his son John Lucas, who was the first in line of the famous Salt House Lucases. It's thought that the site chosen for this building was that of the old castle of the Norman family de la Mer. The Lucas family were originally from Essex, but one, Geoffrey Lucas, came to Gower and married Anne Mansell of Henlis. They lived at Reynoldston in Brinfield. The family are very difficult to follow in that there were many intermixed cousin marriages. A well-known document concerning this family is preserved today and is known as the Lucas Annotation of 1826. John Lucas of Salthouse was a rover and a man described as very stalwart and powerful. John spent nine years adventuring and soldiering, or as it accounts, gone to divers strange countries, engaging his hand in much violating of all laws, but always for our lord the king the king being Henry VIII. Although John returned to Gower and Salt House and married Jane Grove of Paviland, he apparently could not settle for a peaceful life. With his colleagues, George of Einon of Brinfield, Robert de Scourge and the Mansells from Hentlis, smuggled, wrecked ships and made Salt House a great stronghold of ye Salt House with its battlements and walls thereof all around, reaching even unto the cliffs and the rocks, and storing said stronghold with arms. Although it is recorded that this Lucas was a man of furious and ungovernable violence, he always shared his spoils amongst the villagers and the poor. Salt House remained in the Lucas family for seven generations. The last Lucas was another John Lucas, but this time, late 17th century, this particular Lucas of Salthouse was bringing a legal in industry into Port Ainon. He discovered that if the iron-stained shales of millstone grit were mashed, they produced minerals which were useful in making paint. It is said he did buy skiffs at Swainsey in Bristol to bear ye paint mineral away to number of five from near ye salt house, which was his forefathers, across the seas, and to Apelda, and to coasts upon the high seas, to Britain, Verry, and Ogmore, and Nash, and Cardiff, and even unto Bristol. This trade continued until the great storm of 1703, which capsized the skiffs, and the seas flooded in, into the salt house stronghold. Of the time, it is said that John Lucas was on his deathbed, and... Of great grief thereof, he bursted and was dead. Moving away from the Salt House ruins, walked directly towards the long narrow spit of low rock with a small amount of vegetative cover on its summit. This is known as Sedger's Bank, and it's here the last Lucas is reputed to have been buried. It is now a Glamorgan Naturalist's local nature reserve, where many seabirds and waders can be seen, such as purple sandpiper, curlew, and ringed plover. A continuation of Sedges Bank is the rocky area known as Sky Sea, a renowned crabbing ground. They're both islands at high tide, although Sky Sea is often susceptible to high seas. A large bone cave is situated under Potainon Point, but accessible at low tide only, and remains of mammoth, red deer and woolly rhinoceros have been found in the past. From here, walk inland and up cliff westwards, past the old quarries, and on to Portainon Head itself, where, on the edge of the cliff, is a memorial stone dedicated to Dr Gwent Jones and Stephen Lee, two founder members of the Gower Society. It was the Gower Society who assisted the National Trust in purchasing Portainon Point, and then leasing it to the Glamorgan Naturalist Trust. The Society also assisted the Glamorgan Naturalist Trust in purchasing Overton Cliffs. The whole point and Overton Point are now a local nature reserve managed by the Gower Naturalist Trust. The reserve is mainly known for its flora, where some 200 species of flora grow, some rarities.
Birds are abundant also, including breeding warblers, linnets and stone chats. Also can be observed ravens, kestrels, gannets and shearwaters. By taking a narrow path back down towards the sea, you come to a tall, narrow, deep cleft in the rock, which has, over the years, been filled with limestone blocks. This is the famous Portainon Calva Hole. The cleft, as mentioned, has been filled with limestone blocks, showing two rectangular windows and two circular windows above. This was originally thought to be a smuggler's lair, as smuggling was rife in the 18th and 19th centuries, but this, of course, demanded secrecy as the key word, however, and Culver Hole is quite visible from the sea. Also, the Lucas family had the salt house nearby well fortified and made no secret about their activities. A possible clue could be supplied in the actual word culver, which is an old English word for pigeon, and with the small square holes built into the interior walls, they look similar to the, the columbarium, pigeon house, at Penrice and Oxwich. So the question arises, could it have been a giant pig pigeon loft for the salt house? Horatio Tucker, the Gower historian, theorises that this was possibly the pigeon house of the old Portainon castle. A similar place, or perhaps the same place, was mentioned in a 13th century document, the lawsuit records. Also, early in the 16th century, there's evidence that John Lucas repaired and rebuilt Culver Hole, or Culverad Hall, as it, as it was mentioned in the Lucas annotations. John Lucas used it then as a stronghold and armory, and it was said that an underground passage leading from this spot to Salt House, whereof no man knew yet mouth thereof. The wall at his base is ten feet thick, and no provision inside for, for floors was made at various levels, although there are a crude form of stone stairs which climb the inner face of the Great Wall. With this type of construction, storage of inflammable or combustible material would have been ideal. Another point I have considered is the connections between the naval cannons used in the 16th century, known as culverines. Perhaps they were used at Culver too. The last interesting item to have been discovered at Culver Hole was the remains of a mammoth's head. This was discovered in 1860 by the curate of Portainon, Mr. Williams, and a Mr. Mole, Wesleyan Methodist minister, who both collected bones as a hobby. It said, however, that they reinterred this particular one. Leaving the fascinations of Culver Hole, continue westwards to Overton Mere, a little sheltered pebbly beach. From here is a marvellous five-mile stretch of rocky coastland to Worms Head, the tip of Gower. All this coastland is fortunately in the care of the National Trust and is one of the great walks of Gower with superb views. Looking seawards is an area known as Helwick Sands, a notorious six-mile stretch of water where a light vessel, five miles off Worms Head, the Helwick Lightship, marks the western down channel and the east Helwick, boys off Portainon Point, marks up, marks up the, the up channel. The first light vessel was placed in position in 1846. This did not prevent the wrecking, however, of the Brichin Castle of Dundee in February 1847. In fact, this stretch of coastline is known locally as Wrecker's Coast, and with good reason, for many vessels were wrecked from Portainon Point to Worms Head over the past years. In 1913, a Manchester steamer was wrecked near Culver Hole, and in 1928, the Carew Castle floundered and sank near the Helwick Boy. On the rocks at Overton on January the 26th, 1865, the Francis and Anne sank, she was locally known as the Orange Vessel, and her cargo of oranges were found to be scattered over the whole area. There were many others, such as the Epidoro in 1913, the Glan Ravel Minor in 1894, and so it goes on. Going further back, however, we know that an unknown vessel was wrecked under Pilton Cliffs around 1677, as a certain Francis Bevan of Reynoldston removed the figurehead of a lion from the wreck, while in the same area, three local yeomen were caught wrecking the Shepton Mallet of Bristol in, in 1731. There's an old tradition that the Herrick Sands area was an ancient roadway, and many horseshoes had once been found on the sands. Overton is within easy reach from here, a secluded hamlet overlooking Portainon, 
and by travelling through Overton, you, you arrive at the steep main road curving back down to Portainon. About one mile west of Portainon Point, we meet Long Tide Cave, high on Overton Cliff, and it's readily accessible from either above or below the cliffs. The cave itself is appro approximately 40 metres above high water mark, and considerable animal remains and implements were found when originally excavated by Colonel Wood in the 1860s. Passing along the rugged coastline with a heroic sand in the distance showing as a line of broken water at low tide, or a darker band of blue in the sea at the high tide, you arrive at fascinating inlets such as Red Gut, the different slades, and Black Hole Gut. From Black Hole Gut, the next site is Yellow Top, a mass of limestone rock. <clears throat> An Iron Age promontory fort is situated on the top of this headland, consisting of a few lines of banks and ditches. Yellow Top derives its name from the yellow-orange lichens on the rock face, which are co conspicuous in this area. At the base of Yellow Top is one of Gower's masterpieces, Paviland Cave, or more correctly, Goat's Hole. Access is reasonably safe at low water only, but keep a wary eye on the rising tides. It can also be reached by traversing along the rock face. This cave produced a sensational scientific discovery in 1823, when the Reverend William Buckland, the first professor of geology at Oxford and future Dean of Westminster, excavated this bone cave. Buckland unearthed part of a headless human skeleton the bones of which were stained red in colour, along with extinct animals, for example, mammoth and woolly rhinoceros. Buckland assumed the skeleton to be a lady, and it became known as the Red Lady of Paviland. He also concluded that this lady might possibly have been living in Romano-British times, and the bones of the animals found put down to the deluge theory, on which he published his theory in 1823, titled titled Reliquiae Diluviani, or Observations on the Organic Remains Contained in Caves, Fissures, and Diluvial Gravels, and Other Geological Phenomena Attesting the Action of Universal Deluge. However, many years later, in 1913, Professor Solas, Geology Department, Oxford University, re-excavated the cave and with updated techniques and experience behind him, decided that this lady was in fact a young man of the Cro-Magnon race, the earliest form of man, as distinct from Neanderthal man. The red colouring was assumed to be due to ceremonial staining. In recent years, with new dating techniques, radiocarbon dating, etc., it has been established that these bones are approximately 20,000 years old, when man was a predator living off the animals he could kill, such as mammoth and reindeer. Over 4,000 man-worked flints were found at Paviland, together with an ivory ring and bone needles. Paviland Caves may also be reached from the main Rossilli Road at Pilton Green, signposted by the Gower Society, and skirting the fields of Paviland Manor Farm. The, the origins of this building go back to Norman days, and possibly the resident of the Groves, Jane Grove marrying John Lucas of Salthouse Portinon. On reaching the cliff land, the path runs down a steep valley with a dry stone wall running down the centre, eventually coming out on the cliff edges. There is a smaller cave known as Pavilion Western Cave on the same level as the better known Pavilion. It is approximately 40 to 45 metres west above Goat's Hole, but apparently of no great archaeological value. Continuing the cliff walk, you come to an impressive rock formation known as the Nave, and between this and Horse Cliff is an inlet where high in the cliffs is a small bone cave, Deborah's Hole, where the usual flints and bone remains have been found. On the summit of the nave is a promontory fort known as the Nave Cliff Fort. This is not a typical type, as the ramparts seem to belong in relation with the depth of the defended area. It consists of two banks with ditches, forming a third of a circle from cliff to cliff. Excavations in 1938 produced pottery of the pre-Roman era. Around the corner is yet another bone cave known as Red Chamber, Although of no great archaeological interest, the walls of the cave are covered in a red ochre once extracted for commercial use. 
At the rear of this cave is a little narrow tunnel made in the 19th century when the search for lead was popular. Continuing, the next rock outcrop is the tremendous outcrop of Thurber Head with an Iron Age promontory fort, Thurber Head Fort. Apparently, this shows two phases of building, a stone wall curving between the cliffs followed by a system of two banks. From Thurber Head, follow the steep path into Mewslade Bay, derived from the Mew, Seagull and Slade, a cutting in the rock. Mewslade Bay itself has a fairly large expanse of sand, but only visible when the tide is low and is mainly rock when the tide is flooding. Mewslade may also be reached from the hamlet of Pilton by passing Great Pilton Farm and following the National Trust signs. Alternat alternatively, from Middleton on the west side of the valley that comes down to the bay is a small quarry where the bones of several individuals are found in the last century, while opposite and high up on the cliff is the small Mewslade Cave remains of which are in Swansea Museum. Mewslade Bay is also very popular with climbers, with such climbs as the Devil's Wall and Yellow Wall. Our next bay is Fall Bay, a Pleistocene raised beach, where the foreshore displays fine example of zonation. These zones are wide bands of brown, black and orange formed by plant life of the bay. Seaweed such as bladder and flat rack form the brown bands and further down tangle weeds, exposed only during the low spring tides. The black zone is caused by the growth of a lichen which can survive occasionally dampings of high tide, unlike the orange band which is caused by another species of lichen which can survive salt spray but not complete immersion. High above, towering over the east end of Fall Bay is that magnificent outcrop of rock Lewis Castle, with an Iron Age promontory, while below is a popular climb known as South East Pillar. The only headland left between this point and the ultimate of this walk, Worm's Head, is Tears Point, 91 metres. Tears Point clearly shows the erosion caused by sea thousands of years ago. As the sea slowly ebbed, it left stages of carved rocky wave-cut platforms, which can be seen today. Walking up and over Tears Point brings fantastic views over Rossilli Cliff Tops to Worms Head and Rossilli Bay. Chapter 2 The Southwest. The southwest corner, I think, is one of the most interesting and varied parts of Gower, with that rugged, rocky coastline from Portinon to Rossilli, which has engulfed many a shipwreck over the years. Then we have that masterpiece of Gower, Worms Head where one could really feel at the world's end. All of these areas of extremely diverse habitats make up one of Gower's natural nature reserves. The Gower Coast Nature Reserve, where many forms of marine life, flora and seabirds may be observed. Like most of Gower, this corner has its share of ancient history with the remains of Skirlage and Llanthewi Castle, King's Hall and Old Henlis, a bleak ruin on the open moorland backing onto the highest point in Gower, Rossilli Down. Rossilli is the most westerly village in Gower with a noticeable absence of standing trees, owing to the continuous prevailing winds and salt spray. In fact, the only tree, or rather remains, to be found is a hundred-year-old ash tree, if not already removed, in a farmyard opposite the church which had grown to a considerable length only by lying on its side. Rossilli Village, of course, overlooks that magnificent formation of rock plateau, the land's end of Gower, Worm's Head. Above the village towers the highest point in Gower, Rossilli Downs, natural trust owned and 192 metres in height. This is an extremely popular jumping off point these days for those magnificent men in their flying machines, the hang gliders, who soar through the air with the greatest of ease, well the vast majority anyway. There are the few minor scrapes, but fortunately not many. The coast guards who live on the cliff edge below the downs have a fantastic view over the bay and further out to sea, but of course they need it, and they earn every view, especially during the summer months, from crashed hang gliders, lost children, and people falling down cliffs, to overturned yachts and unexploded wartime shells. Yes, it's a coast guard's life, but then with a view like that, 
I would almost do it gratis. It was an old custom for us silly people, whenever they climbed up the downs, to take a stone up with them and add to the pile on the beacon. On the downs we found another Gower burial chamber, Swain's Houses, or Swine Houses, the burial ground of Swain, the Scandinavian sea lord who, had, who is thought to have given the name of Swansea, Swain's Eye, but yet again a matter for some debate. The date of the chamber, approximately 2500 BC. Most of Rosilly Cliffs, Worm's Head and surrounding areas are owned by the National Trust and leased and managed by the Nature Conservancy Council as a natural nature reserve and is known as the Gower Coast Natural Nature Reserve. There is an appointed walkway footpath round the cliffs with glorious views and points of interest. Rosilly Church bears a typical Norman saddleback tower and the inner entrance is protected by a porch with a 12th century Norman doorway which is believed to have been brought from a former church that was supposedly to have been situated in the Warren, a strip of meadowland between the beach and the foot of Rosilly Downs. Although the building you see now is decidedly Norman and once belonged to the Knights Hospitallers, the foundations are of the 6th century. Within the church is a small white marble tablet dedicated to Petty Officer Edgar Evans, who died with Captain Scott on that memorable but tragic expedition to the South Pole. Evans was a Rossilli man, and as Captain Scott narrated himself in his diary, it is quite impossible to speak too highly of my companions. Evans, a giant worker with a re really remarkable headpiece. It is only now I realise how much has been due to him. From Rossilli Cliffs are exhilarating views over the Atlantic and across Rossilli Bay, that fine stretch of sands travelling in three mile arc to Burry Homes at the northern end of the bay. Rossilli is very popular today with tourists and very good for fishing, surfing, canoeing and during the summer months there's a voluntary lifeguard patrol under the auspices of the Gower lifeguards. Overlooking the bay Tucked beneath that towering mass of Rosilli Downs is a large isolated building, the old rectory, and needless to say is full of ghostly tales. It was rumoured that something rather unpleasant comes out of the sea and into the house at night, and pools of cold air experienced within the house. There was a story at one time that the rector heard a voice saying, Why don't you turn round and look at me? Needless to say he fled. Who would not? It is said that these tales have originated from the peculiar noises and shrieks that the blowhole makes on the worm when the sea and the wind are high. A new rectory now has been built nearer the church in the village, to the great relief of one or two of the rectors in the past, no doubt. Passing the Coast Guard's cottages and out onto the cliffs on the seaward side of the park is a very interesting antiquity. At first sight, it resembles a sunny circle of bumps and hollows beneath the turf backing into the cliff and easily missed. This is the Old Castle, the site of a prehistoric fort or defensive village, assumed to be the work of the Iron Age tribe of Silures, who were, who were established in this area about 2,000 years ago, a very bleak and windy situation you'd have thought. Farther out, tucked beneath the cliffs, is Kitchen Corner, where a keen fisherman from Swansea has built a hut on a rock platform. Limestone was quarried here in the 18th century and the 19th century and loaded into boats, some to Devon for lime, others to Swansea and Pinklaud, where it was used in the smelting of copper ore. Rosselli area is famous for the richness of its floral life, as the southerly slope acts as a sun trap and the, the limestone provides ample plant food, resembling somewhat warm, dry Mediterranean lands. Plants such as birds for trefoil, thyme, Thrift and Salad Burnett are abundant, and a rare plant, yellow whitlow grass, which is in fact a small alpine herb flowering in March and April, and apart from growing on the south coast of Gower, is found nowhere else in Britain. We now come to Worm's Head, or the Worm as it's known in Gower, and is the most westerly tip of Gower. The derivation of the word probably comes from the old English word worm, meaning dragon. As from the distance, especially from the sea, this majestic head of rock and hillocks forming the convolutions of a body certainly looks like some form of dragon creature. 
The causeway leading to the worm is exposed for just over five hours at low water, weather permitting. The worm itself consists of small, four small hills, with the highest rising to approximately 150 feet. The complete headland is about 37 acres and a mile long. There is an inner head, the largest of the set, which is levelled flat, a middle head and a low neck leading to the outer head via a natural rock bridge known as Devil's Bridge. A cave is situated on the outer head opening westwards, which is associated with the raised beach, but it is in fact now approximately 15 feet above present high water mark. Access is fairly difficult as the cave ledge is situated on a sheer cliff face. Investigations, however, have been carried out in the past and bones uncovered include those of mammoth, rhinoceros, bear and reindeer, proving at one time easier access was available. The remains of some of these can be seen at the Royal Institution at Swansea. Leland, the antiquary appointed by Henry VIII, wrote of a hole at the point of worm head but few dare enter it, and men fable that a door within the spacious hole hath be seen with great nails on it, but that is spoken the waters there running under the ground is more likely. He also recorded a tradition of an underground passage with spacious, spacious walks linking the worm with a cave at the head of the Gwendraith Vach in David. There is also a hole by the head of Wendraith Vain, where men used to enter in, and they say be spacious walks and that these go as one way under the ground to Worm Head and another to Kerr Kennin Castle, presumably here Carry Kennin. On the north side of the outer head is a hole in the rock known as the Blow Hole, and when conditions are right, a noisy, impressive booming and hissing of air and water under pressure emits forth. There is an old saying by Gaul folk, the old worm's blowing, time for a boat to be going. Apart from its importance of breeding seabirds such as guillemots, razorbills, kittiwakes and, kitty and fulmers, it's interesting to note the unique vegetation. The islands of Worm's Head support an example of ancient vegetation that has been isolated from agriculture settlement and until recently tourism for a long time. The outer head is a very rare ungrazed grassland, while the inner head, which has been grazed, shows a varied range of plant communities. Because of this, work is recently being carried out by the Nature Conservancy Council and enclosures have been set up to study further the differences with botanical and invertebrate life. Visitors to Worms Head, therefore, should keep to the cleared footpath which gives excellent views to avoid damaging the ancient turf. The grass on the flat-topped inner head had a great reputation for producing specially tender mutton when grazed by sheep and the Talbot family of Penrice used to graze a flock on the worm between September and March. The inner head is still grazed today by sheep owned by local farmers. Sea traffic in the 16th century was increasing at a great rate in the Bristol Channel and the area became well known as an easy picking ground for pirates and wreckers alike. Rosilly Sand and area was a venue for many a pirate and smuggler and in the 18th century many loads of stuff contraband were landed there. Most famous of the old Gower wreck was the Dollar Ship in the 17th century. The actual date is unknown, but believed to be between 1660 and 1690. This vessel was apparently laden with gold dollars, and the majority of the ship's treasure was confiscated by Mansell of Henchis in the parish of Llendewi, against his kinsman, who was the lord of the manor. Mansell fled the country, and a local legend surrounds this tale in the form of the spectral chariot of Frosilly Sands. This is supposed to take the shape of a black coach pulled by four grey horses thundering down the sands. An impressive sight, I would have thought. However, years later, gold dollars were being found on the sands, and the Cambrian, a daily paper of the time, recorded that in 1807, 12 pounds of dollars half dollars and pieces of eight were recovered during an, an exceptional equinoctial ebb. Some of the coins were dated 1625 and 1639. In 1833 a similar discovery was made including a cannon now in Helms in Clangenis. 
lead and bullets and antimony apparently in the, the wreck was exposed only for a short while. The coins after examination by the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford, were identified as Peru dollars of Philip IV, minted in Potosi. As mentioned, the exact date of this wreck is unknown and no official record of the vessel is known. Perhaps we might, however, gain a clue if we move farther around in a north direction to Blue Pool near Broughton in the parish of Llangenis. Here, gold moidores were found and the wreck is believed to be Portuguese and is often confused with the dollar ship. So perhaps the two vessels went down at the same time or thereabouts. A letter, however, dated the 21st of March, 1697, from an Alexander Trotter agent to Sir Edward Mansell, mentions duty payable on iron from a Spanish ship, where apparently only half the iron was recovered owing to difficulty in the salvage operations. This might raise doubts to some of the time of, of the wreck, perhaps to 1690, but possibly the re wreck remained submerged until local conditions proved advantageous for it to be visible, thus appearing to some a recent wreck. We could also theorise that the Blue Pool wreck must have been in the late 17th century, as Moidores were Portuguese coins dating 1690 to 1722. This dollar ship might have been one of the three vessels filled with treasure which formed the dowry of a Spanish princess who had married, or to be married, to an English nobleman. Two vessels were lost and one reached port. Possibly the vessel containing the dowry of Catherine of Braganza, who became the Queen of Charles II in 1661, was the one at Blue Pool, as Catherine was Portuguese. We know Catherine herself arrived safely, but no mention was made of her dowry to Charles II. A few years later, after the marriage of Catherine, a Mr. J. Mann reports in State Papers of 1666 a wreck of file vessels laden with wine, sugar and Brazil wood on sands ten miles off Swansea. The men are Portuguese and cannot speak English, hope to have saved the vessel and refuse to save goods, so all are lost. We must assume, allowing for the variance in mileage in those days, that the ten miles mentioned refers to the north coast of Gower where this approximate distance from Swansea would bring us to Whitford Sands, or possibly Broughton. There was also a reputed wreck on Llanridion Marsh. Returning to Blue Pool, there was, in 1797, a remarkable discovery of gold doubloons and moidores, Portuguese coins, 1690-1722. The discovery was made by a John Richards and his wife Honora, who were drawing for fish with nets, and while resting on a rock, they observed a yellow glittering substance in a crevice of the rock. It turned out to be gold, and subsequent searching revealed a large number of these coins. A few years later, 1840 or 1857, two men, Thomas Hollin and William Taylor, searched the same spot and found several of these gold coins sticking in the rock. Later, apparently, others came and blasted with gunpowder, but at this point, the Lord of the Manor, Major Penrice of Kilvru, intervened and stopped them. Apart from one or two found by skin divers on the seabed, none have been found since, and I doubt ever will be, as the ground and tidal movement is rapid in these parts. Later wrecks on Rossilli Bay include the famous paddle steamer City of Bristol, which sank in November 1840. She was out of Waterford, Ireland, homeward bound for Bristol. The cargo was mixed farm produce, 28 pigs, 3 cows and a few passengers. The weather was blustery and they met a strong north wind as they entered the Bristol Channel. At dusk, a headlong could be seen on the port bow. The crew thought it was Worm's Head, but it was, however, Burry Holmes. The crew tried to rectify her course, but it was too late. The ship ran hard onto Rossilli Sands. The waves broke over her, forcing water down into the engine room and blowing the boilers up. Most of the crew and passengers were washed overboard and eventually she broke apart. By morning, only two survivors of the 27 people on board were alive to tell the tale, the ship's carpenter and one of the cattlemen. The remains of the paddle wheels may be seen at low water on Burry Home side of the bay and because of the rough tidal conditions in early 1978, a greater part of the wreck became visible. In 1879, the Mary Stenhouse, 
on tow from Liverpool, ran aground near the old rectory. Ten crew were saved, and the ship was towed off next day by a Llanelli tug. In 1884, the Samuel, with 500 tonnes of steam coal aboard, went ashore near Worm's Head. The coal was landed and sold at one shilling per cartload, or three old pence per bag. Mr Bynan of Great Pilton Farm came down and acquired a large fresh water iron tank from the wreck, and while his horses were pulling up the cliff, one died because of the effort. In 1887, two Llanelli pilot cutters, the Smiling Moor and the Maria, were involved in the collision. The Smiling Moor dragged her anchor and collided with Maria. The crew managed to scramble onto Worm's head. Returning inland from Crosilli, passing Pitton Cross and Pilton Green, the road eventually arrives at the junction of the main Swansea to Portinen Road and the village of Skirlage, comprising a large housing estate, including a medical clinic. Opposite the junction at Skirlage is a narrow lane leading to Berry, where a few farms are situated and limited access on foot to Berry Wood, the Glamorgan Naturalists Trust Nature Reserve. Continuing in the direction of Swansea from Skirlage on the east side of the road, where the farm now stands, is the remains, the old walls, of Skirlage Castle. At one time a manor house stood nearby which Sir Herbert Skirlage built in the 14th century, and it was Richard Skirlage who married into the Mansell family in the 14th century. This was the Skirlage family that often aided the famous Lucas family of the Salt House Portinon. The estates of the Skirlages eventually were inherited by the Gibbon family. Llanthewi is but a stone's throw away, where in the early 14th century lived Bishop Henry de Gower at Llanthewi Castle, now in ruins, situated in a field on the west side of the road. Llanthewi Castle was a type of fortified manor house built by the Mansells and now part of Llanthewi Farm. One of the past residents of the castle was Anne Mansell, that unfortunate lady who met her sudden and tragic death at Oxford Castle involving Sir George Herbert and his men. Standing well back from the road is Llanthewi Church, St David's, and it entered via a wide farmyard where stone stiles lead to the church. Henry de Gower built the church about the same time as the original castle, although it has had the usual renovation as with most Gower churches. The church is said to be of asymmetrical design, possessing the usual saddleback tower, while inside is a great asymmetrical font of ancient origin. From Llandewi is a little known lane leading initially to Henlis and King's Hall, while a footpath continues to the foot of Frasilli Downs. Old Henlis, which is Welsh for Old Courthouse, was an example of a Welsh long house and has a collection of ruined cellars once used apparently by the Henley's band of Mansells for their smuggling activities, while at King's Hall, even further into this relatively unknown and isolated territory, the Lucases were known to frequent. From King's Hall, it is possible to make your way up the back of Frosilly Downs to take in the fine views over Frosilly. Chapter 3 The Northwest Combined with North Gower, this corner of the peninsula was less recently frequented and known than the southern coast. However, today it is becoming more popular, especially Llangeneth and Broughton Bay, with the ever-increasing tourists and caravan sites. The area consists of sandy burrows and wide expanses of sandy bays such as Whitford Sands. Whitford Burrows is another well-known natural nature reserve, and the area provides interesting diverse habitats with the sandy bay and dune area merging onto the salt marshes. This transitional zone of dune to salt marsh, in fact, is considered highly important where almost a quarter of the British flowering plant species may be found. Also, with a neighbouring Burry Estuary wildfowl refuge, the area provides a vast number of wildfowl with over 170 species counted throughout the year. Llangeneth, or Llangeneth to some, lies between Rosilly Down, Hardings Down and Llanmadoc Hill, and the heart of the village remains typically centred around the village green as it was in the days of the Norman Conquest. Apart from the usual cottages, the occasional modern dwellings and the old King's Head public house, Llangeneth boasts the largest church in Gower, founded by Sinhenith in the 6th century, 
Gower's own saint, own saint. Access down the main road, Cock Street, from the King's Head leads to a crossroad, where one road leads to Hill End, a thriving caravan site, and Llangenith Burrows, while other roads lead to Burrows Hall, a small hotel, and Broughton Burrows and Farm, also a caravan site and camping site. Llangenith in its season is very popular with tourists, especially as the majority are catered for at the caravan camping sites. The area is very popular with surfers and surf canoeists, and Llangenith is open to the Atlantic, bringing good breaks, which come rolling in across the large expanse of Rosilly Bay, although these may be much larger and more consistent later on in the season. While on Llangenith, two well-known past personalities must be mentioned, St Kenneth, Gower's own saint, and the more recent Phil Tanner, a representative selection, one might say. The beloved Phil Tanner, folk singer, amongst other talents, died in 1950 and was buried in Llangenith churchyard along with other legendary figures. Phil Tanner came from a family of weavers. Although not a real weaver himself, he tried his hand at anything and everything and apparently loved doing it, whatever. His songs were particularly popular at the old bidding weddings and, in fact, was the last of the bidders. He used to go round the parish a few days before weddings, singing or chanting out the invitations to the respective weddings. One of Phil's favourite haunts was the well-known meeting house in Clangenith, opposite the church, the King's Head Public House, where he entertained many a folk with his singing. Unfortunately, it was only a short while before his death that recordings began on his songs and the style of singing. However, a few of his songs are on record for posterity. Phil Tanner died not long after his 88th birthday in 1950 at the Glanamore Nursing Home in Penmain. St Kenneth is Gower's own saint, and his legendary upbringing is classical in the annals of ancient history. The birth and upbringing of St Kenneth is described in some detail in Capgrave's Nova Legenda Angliae, written in Latin and published in 1516. St Kenneth was of noble blood, the son of Dihocus, a prince of Brittany, who possessed a lovely daughter and was intimate with her. Subsequently, she became pregnant. As the Reverend J.D. Davis puts it, by a most unnatural sin. The child was born with his calf held up beneath its thigh, as a just symbol of the great sin of its conception. It is said that King Arthur ruled Britain at this time and held court at Lacha, apparently on Christmas Day. The child was taken there, where Arthur ordered it to be cast into the river in a wicker cradle. The cradle drifted down river into the Burry estuary and so out to sea. Apparently a storm blew up, and the cradle rode the waves safe and sound towards a place, Worm's Head perhaps, where seagulls in thousands flew around and snatched the child from the waves gently with their beaks and talons. Divinely directed, they made a bed of feathers for him in a hollow of rock and kept off wind and hail with their wings, and before nine days passed, an angel of God descended, bringing a brass bell and placed it by the child's head. The bell had a brazen breast and was preserved in later years as a holy object and called the Titty Bell. When the baby was hungry, he turned his face to the bell and took a sweetened savour of infantile nourishment, the more, des more desirable than all mother's milk and than, and than honeycomb. Apparently no natural childhood secretions passed and the clothes that he was wrapped in adapted themselves to his growth. He was also suckled by a hind but learned from an angel that visited him what foods he should take locally, such as herbs. Eighteen years he stayed on Worm's Head, taught by the angel. Then God instructed him to move to a place about a mile off. On, on the way from Worm's Head, wherever St Kenneth rested, spring suddenly came forth, twenty-four in all. As mentioned, Llangenith has the largest church in Gower and a saddleback tower to crown it. The original site on which now stands this church was in fact that of Llangenith Priory, founded in the 6th century by the Celtic St Kenneth, whose birth and upbringing were legendary, yet his life was recorded in history. The Priory was destroyed by the Danes in 986 and re again rebuilt at the beginning of the 12th century by the then Norman Lord of Gower, supposedly Henry de Newburgh, Earl of Warwick. The revenue from the Priory and lands were granted to the foundation of St. Torin in Normandy. 
the Abbey at Évreux. This was known as an alien priory, that is, the revenue usually seized by the king whenever he went to war with France and returned to French owners when the war ended. However, in 1414, Henry V needed money badly and he seized the revenue of all the alien priories for good. Ultimately, he granted £20 per year pension out of the Clangennet money to a faithful knight with an incredible name, one Sir Hortonk van Cooks, and in 1442 it was granted, including the revenues from land at Bury Home, Pennard, Priors Meadow, Clenridian and Sketty, to buy the crown to an Oxford college, all sold, as a memorial to those who had fallen in the Hundred Years' War. The masters and fellows held the priory and grant until 1838. Inside the church is a Celtic gravestone cover, traditionally that of St Kenneth himself. On the south side of the nave, in a niche, is the effigy of a knight with the lower part of his legs cut off to fit the opening in the wall. This was a member of the de la Mare family. Old locals used to call it the Dolly Mare. He is dated at around 1300 AD as he is depicted in chain mail armour. He was probably one of the Norman de la Mare family who held Castle of Potainon, where the Lucases built a mansion later. In the west end wall of the nave are three carved stone coffin lids. Two show simple crosses, presumably graves of former priors. The third, however, has a more complex interlaced pattern and is pre-Norman. Tradition has it that this marked the grave of the Holy St Kenneth. Also buried at Kengeneth Church is the Welsh Prince, Justin Apgurgan. Descendants of this family can be found listed on a pedigree stone in Penmain Church. Another interesting stone can also be found at Kengeneth and is that of Gordons of Burry Green, or Burry's Green, as cut on the stone, and reads, Richard Gordon of Burry's Green had a wife called Avis, and she died in 1760, aged 100. Born in the first year of Charles II's reign, she died in the last year of Hanoverian George II's reign. The son of Richard and Avis Gordon, another Richard, also of Burry's Green, was 81 when he died. He was, in 1770, High Sheriff of Glamorgan. Access to Llangynid Beach is through Hill End Caravan Camping Site. This, of course, is part of the long stretch of Rosilly Sands from Worms Head at the southerly end to Burry Homes at the northern tip. Not far from Hill End, towards Barry Holmes, is an opening in the dunes where a fresh water stream takes its exit onto the beach. This is known as Dial's Lake, lake being an old Gower name for stream. This was once a mill stream and passes Coity Green before passing down into the sands. The dunes in this part of the northwest corner of Gower are known as Llangenid Burrows and are linked with the more visited Broughton Burrows. Flora in this region is typical of dune systems, which include cooch grass, saltwort, marum, sea rocket, creeping willow, and the popular dewberry, a delicious tasty berry found growing on the ground in runners. An interesting plant has been found in recent years, 1974, is the mauve flowered sea stock. This was thought to have been extinct for some years and was found previously in the dunes of Western Mid Glamorgan in the 1960s. The establishment of this plant in Gower remains a mystery. Human agency apart, but then Gower is always full of surprises. The limestone grass-covered rock that lies off the northern point of Rosilly Bay is known as Burry Homes. It's a tidal island, accessible for several hours on either side of slack water, and although tidal, it was mentioned as a complete island in a charter of 1195. The origin of the word home seems to come from the Scandian word Homer, meaning island. On this outcrop is an Iron Age earthwork, consisting of a single bank and ditch with one or two small Bronze Age cairns on the seaward side of the summit. The most interesting feature on the island, however, is the ruins of a medieval monastic settlement on the landward end of the island. This chapel was known as the Hermitage of St Kenneth Atty Holmes and there are references of the 14th and 15th century relating to hermits using this chapel. It's believed that this chapel was a centre of pilgrimage as a shrine to St Kenneth, Gower Saint. 
Detailed ex excavations of this site were carried out in the late 1960s. On the extreme westerly end, at the summit of this small outcrop, a concrete base may be observed. This was the base of an automatic light which superseded Whitford Lighthouse earlier this century. Burry Holmes is rich in seabirds and cliff flowers. Sheep grazing is rare, but it has a small rabbit population, so grazing is carried out. The main grass is fescue, mixed with Yorkshire fog. Other grasses and plants include thyme, salad burnet, bird's foot trefoil and ladies' bed straw, while in late spring, early summer, a fine display of thrift and sea campion coupled with golden rock samphires may be observed. Crossing back to the mainland towards the dunes of Broughton Burrows, an array of rocks may be noticed. These are called Spaniard rocks. The very name of these rocks conjures up long-lost Spanish wrecks and treasure troves, although unfortunately no hard evidence is available apart from the wrecks on Rossilli and around the corner towards Broughton. Leaving Spaniard Rock and heading to eastwards over the rocks following the watermark of the tide or on the cliff tops dune path, our next call is Blue Pool Bay. But notice before arriving at Blue Pool a natural archway of rock known as Three Chimneys. Blue Pool Bay is aptly named for at the foot of the cliffs is a circular rock pool which fills at high tides and is certainly a deep blue looking colour, especially in the summer months. The legend of this pool informs us that it is, it is or was bottomless. Today, of course, it is a mere 15 feet deep, depending on local tidal conditions and prevailing winds, as the pool tends to silt up with blown sand. It is here, in 1797, between Blue Pool and the Rock Archway's Three Chimneys, the remarkable discovery of gold doubloons and moy doors was made. Just above Blue Pool, in the dunes nearby, are the remains of a stone-walled Iron Age enclosure, while not far away, under the cliffs, is a cave with the same name as that interesting featured Potainan, Culver Hole. To differentiate, however, we call it Clangenith Culver Hole and it is a total contrast to its namesake in Port Ainan. It is situated in the cliffs to the west of the natural arch, three chimneys, only accessible at low water and seen as a long vertical slit in the limestone cliff. A narrow passage leads from the opening, giving access to a sizable dark chamber. Past excavations have produced quantities of human bones, and a few items of Iron Age and Roman periods, and numerous fragments of coarse pottery, which included portions of up to 12 plain cylindrical urns of the late Bronze Age, about 1000 BC. This type of pottery is considered a rarity for the South Wales area. It is thought that the cave was used as an ossuary, a resting place for the bones of the dead, possibly by a small immigrant community. Moving on from Blue Pool Bay eastwards past the limestone outcrops of Minor Point, Foxhole Point and Tulk Point, we arrive at Broughton Bay. This bay is very popular with holidaymakers, with two caravan camping sites very nearby, and popular with surfing fraternity. Beware, however, these are treacherous waters where the estuary meets the open sea and currents swirl close inshore. It is envisaged in the very near future to provide a voluntary lifeguard patrol over. Until then, then, a seasonal inshore patrol service is provided by the RNLI at their Barry Port Station. And even closer to hand, at Broughton Farm, is a voluntary manned inshore craft. Looking eastwards over the vast expanse of Whitford Sands are the dunes of Whitford Burrows, a natural nature reserve. Situated on the eastern side of Broughton Bay, near to Hill's Tor, are two cave entrances, high in the face of the Tor, and access is by a steep sandy slope. These caves are very shallow and connect by a low tunnel into one and known as Spritsail Tor Cave. The cave was discovered during quarrying working in 1839. Excavations shortly afterwards revealed fragments of Roman pottery and a few human bones and hyena bones were particularly abundant. We are now on the open stretch of Whitford Sands and in the parish of Llanmadoc. In January 1868, Whitford Sands was the scene of a mass wreck involving 16 wrecks. 
The vessels were 80 to 400 tonnes laden, mainly coal, and were out from Llanelli when they were caught in a sudden extraordinary ground sea. The surviving vessels had anchored around Whitford Lighthouse. It was not until the following morning that the local inhabitants discovered what had happened. It must have been an amazing sight, for the whole of the sands were covered in wreckage, coal and bodies. The men were buried in the graveyards of Llanmadoc and Llangenis churches. There was an earlier wreck in December the 19th, 1819, involving the Bounty Hall, an East Indiaman, 200 tons, laden with cargo of rice, sugar and spices. As the Reverend J.D. Davis tells us in his history of West Gower, that at the time of this particular wreck, the Lloyd's agent and recoverer of droids, George Holland, lived then at Cum Ivy. A more relatively recent wreck was the SS Evangeline in 1904. Although not badly damaged, and local farmers were hired to carry the stones ashore, she was taken to Llanelli a few months afterwards. At the time of writing, the only known wreck of consequence at Whitford for some time was the trawler wrecked in 1977 near Whitford Lighthouse and subjected to the usual stripping. Whitford Burrows is a small peninsula of its own, stretching out for about two miles into the Burry estuary. Whitford comprises mainly a series of dunes, beach and estuarine habitats. The actual burrows or sand dune areas are about 670 acres. The whole area, including part of the surrounding marsh, belongs to the National Trust, managed and leased by the Nature Conservancy Council as a national nature reserve. It's interesting to note that Whitford Burrows was the first property to be acquired in Great Britain as a result of the funds of Enterprise Neptune, the National Trust's campaign to safeguard our coastline. The acquisition was brought about by a remarkable example of cooperation initiated by the Glamorgan Naturalist Trust, who solicited a loan from the Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves on behalf of the National Trust in January 1965. Whitford is originated from the Danish word Whitfjord, and this is probably derived from long ago before the estuary was dredged, when there were supposed to have been stepping stones across the estuary to what we now call David. Indeed, there was a causeway across to Burryport, part of which still remains, from the proximity of Whitford's lighthouse. An elderly resident who lived at Landy Moor recalls crossing over to Burryport some 60 years ago. The Methodist minister founder John Wesley crossed these very sands on horseback on July the 31st, 1764, as an account in his personal diary reveals. July 1764, Tuesday the 31st. An honest man of Cadwelly told us there was no difficulty in riding the sands, so we rode on. In ten minutes one overtook us, who used to guide persons over them, and it was well he did, or in all probability we'd have been swallowed up. The whole sands are at least ten miles over, with many streams of quicksands intermixed, but our guide was thoroughly acquainted with them, and with the road on the other side. By his help, between five and six, we came well tired to Oxwich in Gower. John Wesley reached Kidwelly between one and two, so it took him approximately four hours to cross the estuary. Today, of course, this journey would be out of the question except by boat, since the estuary has been well dredged and the tides are swift and dangerous. It's also not- interesting to note here, Whitford Lighthouse, now disused, is one of the very few cast iron lighthouses left in the world and is now owned by the Department of the Environment. It was erected in the 1850s and was laid up in 1904 when an automatic light went into operation on Barry Holmes, also now not in use and taken down. The internal base is reputed to be of thick lead. In 1661, an indenture of deed on lease on Whitford Burrows, executed by Sir John Aubrey of Llantrithed, whereby as a condition the tenants were to plant sedge on one day every year in the burrows, presumably to build up the dunes, so erosion problem is not quite a new one. Apparently, where now only dry sand exists on Whitford Beach, trees flourished, and we know that there were, uh, they were there around 1500 AD, as they were mentioned after the Act of 1553, Queen Mary I, an act touching the sea sands of Glamorganshire. 
The majority of the inner burrows is now planted in conifers, mainly Corsican pine planted 30 to 35 years ago when the area was farmed. The various habitats of salt marsh, dunes and beach support distinctive communities of invertebrates such as the rare woodlouse, Armadillium album, the beetle Uranebria complanata, which can be found on the strand line of the beach. This area is renowned for its wildfowl. With a Burry wildfowl refuge nearby, many wintering wildfowl may be seen such as widgeon, ida, shell duck, brent geese and oyster catchers. Also near Whitford Point, many divers, waders and other migratory birds can be observed. The damp hollows found in the dunes are known as slacks and provide cover for a variety of fauna such as locally rare fen orchid and March helberin. The village that overlooks Whitford Burrows and adjoining marshes is Clanmaddock and consists of the main road, Rattle Street, running down towards Cheriton. Clanmaddock is situated on the slopes of Clanmaddock Hill, 185 metres, and was once a lively weaving centre and part of the reconstructed woollen factory at St Fagans came from here. The Church of St Maddock is reputed to have been founded in the 6th century by that saint who was a pupil of St Kenneth at Llangeneth College. The present construction is around 13th century and is the smallest church in Gower. It possesses a small tower with a well, with a well-known combination of saddleback roof and parapets. The actual tower was lowered when extensive renovations took place in 1865. The nave and the chancel were also considerably altered. Because at the time of the alterations, the graveyard had risen nearly four feet above the floor of the nave, the chancel arch had to be reconstructed to level everything up. However, the church still retains a Norman font and Romano-Celtic tombstone, which was discovered in 1861, built into a wall of the old rectory by the famous Gower historian, the Reverend J.D. Davis, rector. The stone was removed from its ancient hiding place and placed in the church. It dates back to the 5th or 6th century, and the inscription in Latin reads, Duecti filius goan hic jacet, Duectus son of Guan lies here, or Advecti filius iguani hic jacet, The stone of Avectus, son of Ivanus, lies here. Llanmadoc is one of the few churches in Gower where traces of medieval wall paintings, which originally decorated the walls, were found when the church was restored. Returning to Llanmadoc and taking the little road beyond the post office shop brings you to Llanmadoc Hill, 186 metres, formed of old red sandstone and limestone with fine views from the ridge of both North and South Gower. On the ridge of the hill, fragments of a cist vine remain, a small coffin-shaped structure which once lay underneath an earthen burrow. Bronze Age cairns are to be found scattered here and there, and there are twelve in all. Found here too is Llanmadoc Bulwark, a typical defended enclosure of the late Iron Age. It is the second largest in Gower, Kil Evil Top being the largest. The surrounding banks and ditches are well preserved and complex in plan. Their form suggests that the original defences were enlarged over a period of years, as this seems to show at least seven phases of reconstruction, perhaps hinting on unsettled conditions. One theory is that originally this enclosure was initially for cattle, etc., and enlarged later to accommodate people in time of raids. Nearby is the modernised dwelling house of Stormy Castle, and well named it is, for the elements battle across these moors with great force. Outside Stormy Castle is a metalled track, which one way leads down to the ruins of Llanmadoc Old School. Llanmadoc School in the 1860s was actually a building adjacent to Stormy Castle, where William Hall and his wife Jane were the appointed teachers. The building, however, was not very suitable and a new construction was erected where the ruins now stand, the site being acquired from the Penrice estate, apparently financially assisted by Starling Benson, JP, of Fairy Hill, Stembridge. The school served the children from Llangeneth, Burry Green and Cheriton, as well as Llamadoc, and was known as the Hill School. The Reverend J.D. Davis, rector of Llanmadoc and Cheriton up till 1911, 
played an important role in the management of the school and assisted in the finances by selling some of his wood carvings. Hill School eventually closed in 1935. Taking the metalled track upwards past Stormy Castle again, we reach an old farmhouse and ruins of Pen Money's house. Looking south from here in the distance is Harding's Down, 157 metres, showing two prominent Iron Age earthworks. In between these two hills of Clanmadoc and Harding's Down is open ground known as Tanky Lake Moor, where the legend informs us the holders of the bulwark met the occupants of Harding's Down Fort in a furious battle. The bulwark's leader, Tonkin, was killed, and so fierce the battle and slaughter that the blood rose over the warrior's boots. If we look eastwards behind Llanmadoc Hill, there is the open common of Ryers Down, part National Trust owned, where from the summit, 115 metres, you overlook Cheriton Valley with access to Stembridge. Opposite Ryers Down, on the other side of the little tarmac road, and situated at the corner of Clenmada Clengen, the prominent farm of Kennoxton. At this point stood a farmhouse, and being a classic example of a Welsh longhouse, was taken down stone by stone in the early 1950s and removed to St Fagan's Museum near Cardiff, where it can be seen today. One of the families to live in the old farmhouse for generations were the Rogers, whose names can be seen at Llangeneth Church. Returning down Llanmadoc Hill towards the village, there are several buildings lower down on the slope of the hill. One group, recently extended, is a very old building, now a public house, and known as Danes Dyke. While more westerly, the early beginnings of Penmanid Wildlife Park, where at the present time deer and several species of wildfowl are in residence. By turning down past the enclosed wildlife park, we come to a narrow stone-filled lane, arched by brambles and shrubs. This leads to Catchpool Lane. Here is situated a long building, now pre three private cottages, which at one time was also a type of Welsh longhouse, where the family lived at one end and the stock the other. Turning down the old rocky path with Llanmadoc Hill behind, you come to a gate and stile, over this and you are back to Llanmadoc Church, where the famous Reverend J.D. Jenk Davis was rector of Llanmadoc and Cheriton for 44 years. He died in 1911, aged 81 years, and was a man of many talents, but surely his love and labour of the history of West Gower must have been the ultimate. It is the Bible of Gower. He was an accomplished woodcarver and carved the altar of Llanmadoc Church together with that of Cheriton and Llanridion. There is a tablet to his memory in his church and on the stone gatepost outside. Another rector of the parish with a long record of service who was commemorated within the church for 22 years, W. L. Knight Clark held the living and died in 1795, aged 74 years. Llanmadoc was one of the last villages in Gower to celebrate the feast day of its saint, known as the Mapsant, which was held on the 12th of November each year. The Reverend J.D. Davis enjoyed these village festivities, unlike one of his contemporaries, the Methodist minister William Griffiths, 1819, who said of the Mapsant, an ungodly gathering and a meeting of the devil for drinking and dancing. A famous visitor to Llanmadoc not too long ago was Ernest Jones, a Gowerton man and disciple of Sigmund Freud, the psychoanalyst. Ernest Ernest Jones holidayed frequently in Llanmadoc and is reputed to have stayed in the small whitewashed cottage in Rattle Street known as T. Gwynne. It's also reputed that he brought Sigmund Freud himself on one occasion as a retreat from the Nazi group in Germany during the 1939-45 war. Going on past the church toward Broughton Bay, we pass the turning to St. Maddox's Christian Youth Camp with its own tiny church. Carrying on further past Whitford Caravan site, we come to a dead end, Broughton Bay and Legadranta Farm, from the Welsh Llegad Anantai, I, or source of the streams. Legadranta Farm is reputed to have been one of the last places to have been visited by the legendary Gower fairies, the very Vokes. The story goes that an old woman visited the farm and asked the farmer's wife for the loan of a sieve. The farmer's wife declared she did not have one, 
but the old woman, reputative, replied, I'll take the one you have over there, over the vat straining hops. Obviously, the farmer's wife now suspected that the old woman was, in fact, one of the very vokes, for it was well known, in fact, that they used, to, used sieves for to sifty gold. Needless to say, she at once gave the sieve to the old woman, for it was considered ill luck not to assist the very vokes in any request. Several days later, the old woman brought the sieve back and said, since you were so good as to lend it to me, the biggest cask in, your cask in your house shall never be without beer. She then proceeded towards the well and disappeared into it. For many weeks it was reputed that La Gadrante revelled in free beer. However, one of the conditions laid down by the old woman was that the farmer's wife should on no account tell anyone else of the secret. Of course, the farmer's wife could not keep this secret for long, and immediately on telling a neighbour, the supply of beer mysteriously dried up. Returning to Llamadoc Church and progressing down the lane is the hamlet of Comaivi, and access to Whitford Burrows once more. It was here in a field, Parca or Odin, the field of the kiln, at the foot of Comaivi Woods, a farmer ploughed up a curious old bell, rectangular in shape, with traces of bright shining substance thought to be gold. Apparently, it was said to resemble the ancient elaborately decorated bells from Ireland, where sacred bells were carried by many of the old saints. Naturally, we will immediately think of the famous Titty Bell of St. Kenneth. Did each saint in Gower carry one of these bells? Or might this even be the Titty Bell of St. Kenneth? Another intriguing Gower mystery. The bell is now in the National Museum for Wales, in Cardiff. While at Comaivi, there are some fine views across the estuary and marsh, with Whitford in the foreground. Comaivi Woods is but a stone's throw away, and access is by walking down the metalled track adjacent to the little car park of Comaivi Farm, overlooking Comaivi Marsh. The woods are managed by the Glamorgan Naturalist Trust as a local nature reserve, and a footpath runs along the edge of the woods, leading ultimately to Cheriton via Frog Lane. The wood itself contains a diverse habitat and is basically a wooded escarpment on an outcrop of limestone, where the plant Herb Paris may be found. Birds such as buzzard, green woodpecker, kestrel and occasionally merlins may be seen, along with the ever-present pe pigeons and crows. There are a few badgers, also rabbits and hares, while the fox pre prefers the dunes in Whitford or the hills of Llanmadoc. At the far end of the woods towards Cheriton, at the edge of the marsh, two cot cottages are situated, Pill House and Pill Cottage, neatly tucked away beneath the woods and Cumaivy Old Quarry. On the Cumaivy Marsh side of these cottages is the remains of the Old Harbour, when in the middle of the 19th century Llanmadoc was a bustling seaport and limestone was loaded from Comaivy Quarry. Passing the quarry and a stone cairn denoting the woods belonging to the Glamorgan Naturist Trust, a further stone building may be noticed. On closer inspection, it will be seen to possess a high access step to prevent flooding from the marsh and double barn type entry doors. This was at one time a type of boathouse, but has also served as a mortuary and now a storehouse. To continue up the track brings you to a gated access to Frog Lane, the main road, and the Britannia Inn public house. Many years ago there were quite a number of pubs between Cheriton and Llanmadoc. Today there's only one, the Britannia Inn. The Farmer's Arms, further up the road, closed down in the late 60s. The Britannia Inn was the meeting place and headquarters in the 19th and early 20th century for the ancient order of foresters, in which the Reverend J.D. Davis was, was an active member. Behind the inn is the marsh, and looking eastwards is that prominent outcrop of limestone, North Hill Tor, or locally, Nottle. This is part of land owned by North Hill Farm, Cheriton, where, on the landward side of the Tor, are the remains of ditches of a promontory Iron Age Fort. North Hill Tor was once quarried, and the small caves in the limestone rock proved an ideal place for eligible men when the press gangs arrived during the Napoleonic Wars. 
From below North Hill Tor, it's possible to walk on the edge of the salt marsh, following the foot of the line of the limestone cliff, known as Tor Gro, eventually arriving at Landimore. Our next village, however, is Cheriton. Cheriton is believed to be possibly derived from the combination of Tun, church farm, and the abundance of cherry trees in the area. <clears throat> The little hamlet commences properly from the Britannia Inn public house, where the road zips down, past the Methodist chapel, with the old forge now in ruins, on a little green up on a bank opposite. Where the road comes to a bend is a little valley, with the Burry Pill wandering out into the marshes, and here, set in very attractive surroundings, is Cheriton Church, dedicated to St. Catug, St. Cadog. The church you see today is a typical example of the 13th century and the work of imported craftsmen. The majority of the woodwork, however, is the result of the handiwork of the Reverend J.D. Davis, 1830-1911, rector of Flenmadoc and Cheriton up to 1911. Reverend Davis carved the choir stalls, altar, pews and the magnificent embossed wooden ceiling. There is a story that the font now present in the church was the ancient font from Landimore Medieval Church, now extinct, and looking closely you may observe a portion chipped off. This it was said was to be the result of the font falling off the cart when it was pulled down the steep hill into Cheriton from, from Landimore. Although today the church stands peacefully in a relatively secluded area, in 1770 it was the scene of a land dispute involving a riot between the famous families of the Lucas, the Stout Hall versus the Horton line, descendants of the old Salt House line of Lucas. Apparently, the rector, the Reverend John Williams, was locked in his church by the crowd as, according to those famous documents, the Lucas annotations, it being offensive to shed blood in the sight of clergy. Now pulled down and in ruins, a building known as the Great House stood overlooking the church. This was the home of one of the well-known Gower families of the past, the Craddocks. Sir Matthew Craddock was steward of Gower in 1491 and again in 1497, and it was Mary Craddock of Cheriton who married the second Geoffrey Lewis of Stouthall, Reynoldston. The building now standing next to the church is Glebe House, now a farm. This is a 15th century building and reputed to be the last house built in Gower by the order of the Knights Hospitallers of St. John. The rector of Cheriton, 1751 to 1787, John Williams, laid down a ghost in Glebe House, which was said to have been haunting the interior. The spirit was apparently that of a woman who at one time farmed the surrounding lands and sold her wares of butter and milk, etc., to the locals, but in short measures. Upon her death, the legend says she returned to haunt the house, crying, Wait and measure, wait and measure, etc. The Reverend John Williams was shut up in the room for two days and nights, where people of the house could hear the cracking of his whip and reciting Latin verses suitable for the occasion. Eventually, the spirit was bound to make ropes of sand on Llanmadoc Burrows, Whitford, and remained until it was done, an eternal task, one would have thought. Opposite St. Caddock's Church, at the rear of the little cottage, is a stone stile where a footpath marks the start of a fine walk through Cheriton Valley. The footpath follows a stream known as the Burry Pill, where otter often frequent in their search for trout, and to continue on the path, passing the remains of an ancient sunken road, brings the walker to the old mill at Stembridge. However, if the walker decides to cut his journey short, about halfway through the valley, there's access to a metal track near Kittle Farm, which leads out onto the main Clenmadoc Road. At this point is Bove Hill Farm, and access down a narrow lane to our next northwest hamlet, Landimore. This is a village that too was once a small busy port and a thriving weaving centre, while today it is a quiet hamlet overlooking the marshes with a few modern houses to remind us of modern progress. To ca carry on through Landimore and down the narrow lane brings the visitor to Landimore Marsh, where fine views over the marshes to Whitford in the west and Claridian in the east may be taken in. In the distance are the hills of David, 
while in the foreground is the Burry Wildfowl Refuge. Part of Landymore Marsh is used by the West Glamorgan Wildfowlers Association, but under strict shooting management control. Wildfowl most commonly seen on the marshes include mallard, teal, widgeon, shell duck, pintail, brent geese, and the ever-present lapwings and curlew. Landymore Marsh is drained by a large channel known as the Great Pill, and in early summer the marsh is carpeted with the flowers of pink thrift. The flora is typical of the surrounding habitat, and other plants to be found include sea aster and lavender, while late summer produces the blooms of the marshmallow. There are several types of sea rush, juncus, and of course the dynamic cord grass, spartina. Landymore, or Bovehill Castle, is situated perched on a small spur of land overlooking the North Gower marshes. Unfortunately, only a ruinous area remains, a few walls overgrown with ivy and brambles. The history of Bove Hill and its inhabitants is intermittent, and the exact date of construction unknown, but probably 12th century. We know that the castle was in possession of Llewellyn ab Yorweth, Prince of North Wales, 1195 to 1240, after which it belonged to Sir Gilbert de Turbill of Coity Castle, Glamorgan, up to 1335. There is confusion over the dates here, and about 1399, when the death of Thomas de Mowbray, first Duke of Norfolk, occurred, Landemore Castle was apparently in his possession on his death. In 1420, it was given by the third Duke of Norfolk, obviously kept in the family, to Sir Hugh Johnnies, or the Welsh Yonnies, a knight and deputy marshal of England. The fine brass of Sir Hugh and his wife, Dame Maud, may be seen in St Mary's Parish Church of Swansea, where several inscriptions in Latin can be read. The main one reading, Good John, Duke of Norfolk, gave unto him the manor of Landy Moore, to him and to his heir for evermore. The Duke, however, must have been withdrawn the gift because in 1461 Landymore was returned to the list of landed estates in Gower, as in the Duke's possession on his death on the November the 6th, 1461. Returning to the brass of St Hugh at St Mary's, there are several other inscriptions in the form of a label emitting from each other's mouths, from the lady, Fiat mihia dine super nos, Lord have mercy upon us while from the knight's mouth, unfortunately now damaged during the war, Que ad modu sperveum in te, as we have put our trust in thee. Sir Hugh Ionis was descended from Sir David Gam, through Gam's daughter Gladys. Sir Hugh was a knight and crusader, receiving the honour of knighthood at the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem on the 14th of August, 1441. Apparently his date of death is uncertain, but in 1463 he purchased of Richard Cause a certain Burbage with its appurtenances in Fisher Street, Swansea. Sir Hugh's wife, Dame Maud, was daughter of Rhys Craddock, first cousin to Sir Matthew Craddock Knight. Sir Hugh made the castle into a fortified manor and piped water using lead pipes from a water supply, a well on Ryers Down, to the castle. My family once owned part of this land of Landymore Castle, and on clearing out a ruined stables, found many pieces of lead piping, along with a leaden drinking mug and kiln-fired fired cannonballs. Our next inhabitant of the castle is dated around 1470, when it was in possession of William, Earl of Pembroke. There's now yet another short break in the history, until it passed into the hands of Sir Rhys Sub Thomas, supporter of Henry the Seventh. Sir Rhys. Sir Rhys also owned Webley. From here on, the Landymore Castle was handed down to Sir Griffith, son of Rhys Thomas and then grandson of Rhys Griffith. Landymore had no present church, but there is said to have been a church in medieval times, as it was mentioned in 1230 in the confirmation of Bishop Anselm. The exact location, however, is unknown, but perhaps by applying the literal translation of the old Welsh spelling of the village, Landymore, we might acquire an insight as to its original whereabouts. Llan in Welsh usually means church or enclosure, while Mor is sea, so translated the church by the sea. However, in modern times, we have to take in, in account 
for the fall in water level to the estuary, so our church remains would be found on much higher ground today. Indeed, a very mature inhabitant of Landymore confided in me that stones thought to belong to the church were found in the grounds of a dwelling house which is approximately a hundred metres from the edge of the marsh. Looking eastward to cross the marsh from Landymore and perched on the edge of the cliff is Webley Castle, which marks our first call on North Gower. Chapter 4. The Heart of Gower this area in the main consists of scattered villages surrounded by open, undulating common moorland, with narrow, sunken, winding lanes leading to secluded villages such as Bury and Stembridge. The village of Reynoldston is considered the centre of Gower and is situated at the west westernly foot of that five-mile ridge of Gower, Kevin Bryn, the backbone of the peninsula while on the ridge itself, the northerly flank is that legendary burial chamber, King Arthur's Stone, considered the Mine Ketty of Wales. Although we're at Reynoldston is by no means the largest village in Gower, it certainly is the most centrally situated and one of the highest placed villages in the peninsula, as it rambles alongside the western slopes of the backbone of Gower, Kevin Bryn. It is in fact the crossroads of north and south, and mainly because of this, the village houses the emergency services for the Gower area, such as fire brigade, ambulance and the police. Reynoldston always seems such a calm village, with sheep grazing almost everywhere you turn. There are, however, a number of new small housing estates being built up round the village, but as yet, Reynoldston has still maintained its original character, and hopefully will continue to do so for some time. On the edge of the village is, is one of the old Gower Tudor houses, now renovated, Brinfield, and was once the home of the famous Lucas family of Gower. Climbing the hill above Reynoldston leads to the, the red sandstone summit of Kevin Bryn, Black Hill in Welsh. Kevin Bryn is the second highest point in Gower and one of the best vantage points in Gower where seven old counties can be seen, apart from the fine panoramic views of the peninsula itself. There is a magnificent ridge walk to the eastern end of Kevinbrin, almost five miles of fine views and scenery, to overlook Penn Main. This is the highest point of the ridge. Walking back towards Reynoldston, the walker would probably choose a route known as Talbot's Way, named after R. M. Talbot, the 19th century occupier of Penrise Castle, who used this route for hunting and riding. Not far from the route on the northern flank of the ridge is Holywell, now enclosed by the Water Authority and part of the water supply feeding Gower. Back at the western end of Kevinbrin, and not far from the main road overlooking North Gower and its marshes, is yet another fascinating wonder of Gower, King Arthur's Stone. This is a Neolithic chambered tomb dated approximately 2500 BC, of uncertain origin, but with a capstone, a glacial boulder, said, said to weigh 24 tonnes, and surrounded by a number of smaller stones. This is thought to be the mine stone, Ketty, one of the wonders of ancient Britain and full of legend. Principally, it owes its name to that legendary King Arthur, who it is said flung this stone from his shoe while in Carmarthenshire, now Dovid, and on certain nights it is said the stone visits the sea for a drink. Proceeding back to Reynoldston and passing the large public house nat naturally known as the King Arthur brings us back to the village itself. The church is situated back from the village green on the way to the fire brigade and ambulance headquarters and is dedicated to, S to St George. By tradition, the church was founded by Reginald or Reynold de Breos a Norman family who gave his name to the village. Reynold died in 1228, so the church is thought to have been built in the early part of the 13th century. However, as with many other churches in Gower, it was probably built on the site of an earlier Celtic church, possibly 6th century. Originally, the church consisted of, of a nave and square-ended chancel with a narrow arch connecting the two. At the end of the south wall was a porch and a small bell cot raised over the western end of the church. By 1756, the Reverend Thomas Talbot of Penrice had become patron of the church upon succeeding the Penrice and Margam estate under the will of his uncle, the third Lord Mansell. Reverend Thomas 
Talbot erected a gallery across the western end of the church, which was entered from a, a door high up in the wall of the nave, reached by an exterior flight of stone steps on the west side of the porch. By the mid-19th century, many churches in Gower had fallen into a sad state of neglect and disrepair, including Reynoldston. So during the 1860s, the church was pulled down and rebuilt at a cost of £1,500. The church, as seen today, was reopened for services on November the 3rd, 1867. The Lucas family are prominent names on tombstones and, and memorials, the family living at Fairy Hill, Brinfield Hills Farm and Stout Hall, previously Stout Walls. The bell is dated 1738 and only bears the initials W.E. for our information. The parish register of baptisms, marriages and burials dates back to 1632 and almost complete from 1813. Not far from Reynoldston towards the village of Nelston is a large mansion situated in its own parkland type grounds known as Stout Hall. This was once the home of the Lucas family and then known as Stout Walls. John Lucas built the mansion in the late 18th century although there is confusion over the actual dates but believed to be between 1754 and 1790. This building was an extension, so to speak, of the family's house in Reynoldston, Brinfield, and there's said to be a large connecting underground passage between the two. In the ground of the mansion is a pre-Norman carved stone, possibly 10th century, which was found and erected there by John Lucas himself to mark the grave of his horse while in the grounds the remains of a fake druidical stone circle may be seen, one of the Lucas Follies. The house has been used for many purposes over the past few years, such as a convalescent home, and now owned by the London Borough of Merton, and run as an outdoor educational centre. Leaving Stout Hall and following the main road brings the traveller to the village of Nelston, consisted of a consisting of a few farms, several houses, and the ruins of the old church in the grounds of a farm. The church is said to have two dedications, one Celtic St. Torin, and one thought to be Norman, but in Welsh it is known as Llanavair Mair, or the Church of the Three Marys, presumably the three being Virgin Mary, Mary of Bethany, and Mary Magdalene. However, it's known that in the 12th century, the tithes of Nelston were presented to the monastery of St. Torin in Normandy by one of the then Gower Lords, Roger Beaumont, Earl of Warwick. Today, Nelson has a Baptist chapel situated on the side of the main road. From Nelson, we travel down the road to Llanderwy and meet up with the crossroads of our particular journey, where we cross the boundaries of our southwest corner of Gower. So we now explore the little lane leading off from Llanthewi with the Burry Pill flowing alongside, which eventually leads us to the hamlet of Burry itself. Here, the Burry stream forms the western boundary of Kevinbrin Ridge, where access is available to Burry Green, Frogmore, Reynoldston, Fairy Hill and Stembridge. Not far from Burry, on a sharp bend in the lane, is a building, now a farm, known as Cadiz Hall. Cadiz is reputed to have its origins from the family of Cady or Cade and was thought to be a corruption of this name. In 1394 there was a Johannes Cade and in 1398 a Jura Johannes Cady. Another view some earlier writers took was the name might be linked with the Spanish Cadiz and with good reason. It was Cad Cadiz where Sir, Sir Robert Mansell, Vice Admiral of the Fleet, and Admiral of the Narrow Seas was knighted by Queen Elizabeth I in recognition of his victory at Cadiz in 1596. However, although he's related to the Gower Mansells, there's no apparent record of him living in Reynoldston. His portrait, painted in 1615, hangs in Penrice Mansion. Passing Cadiz Hall, continue down the lane with the Water Authority sewage station on one side of the road until you come to a crossroads. Straight opposite is a narrow lane leading to Windmill Farm, southwards Reynoldston, but northwards Fairy Hill Mansion and Stembridge. Fairy Hill Mansion lies in the narrow lanes leading to Stembridge, with the Burry Pill running not far from the side of the road. Part of Fairy Hill, thought to be the old stables, 
was originally one of the residences of the Lucas family, then known as Pear Tree. In the 19th century, Ferry Hill was the home of the Benson family. Thomas Benson came to Swansea from Kent and lived at Sketi Park in 1830, while his son, Starling Benson, was chairman of Swansea Harbour Trust for a time and lived at Ferry Hill in the mid-1860s. Before the Bensons, however, a well-known figure resided at this mansion in the early 19th century in the form of Lady Barham, whom we meet at Burry Green. Passing Fairy Hill is the building of Stackpole Mill, now renovated as a private house, which was at one time one of the grist mills of Gower, the wheel being turned by the flowing waters of the Burry Pill, which flows from here to Cheriton and out onto Cheriton Clanmadoc Marsh. Around the corner and up the hill in a westerly direction is the village of Burry Green, a small village with a relatively large green, as the, as the name suggests. The village comprises a few houses, mainly on the north side, while a few farms exist on the south side towards the hamlet of Burry. The only church here is the chapel of Bethesda, one of many built in the 1800s, with the assistance by that remarkable woman, Lady Barham, 1763 to 1823. Lady Barham lived for a time at Fairy Hill, Stembridge, and was the daughter of Charles Middleton, First Lord of the Admiralty, at the time of Trafalgar. Bethesda was built in 1814, and the first of many to be built in Gower, that is, Bethel at Penclough in 1816, Trinity at Cheriton, 1816, Paraclete, Newton, 1818, Emmanuel, Pilton Green, 1821, and Mount Pisgah in 1822 at Ilston. Returning back down the hill to Stembridge and to continue up the steep hill on the other side is the sharp bend of Stembridge Corner, where a narrow lane leads off the main road taking the traveller to Landy Moor. On the corner is a private house and within the grounds, against a bank, is an opening with access to a very interesting cave system, that of Stembridge. To continue on the main road brings us to one or two buildings and a farm with the name of Mansellfield, or known as Mansell's Fold, a familiar name in Gower. Passing the farm, the main road opens into the village of Old Walls, but just before the village, on the south side of the road, is a track le leading to Llwyne Bulch, now a riding school, isolated on the foot of the northern flank of Kevin Bryn. This was once associated with the ancient family at Webley Castle, that of the Gordons. We are now in Old Walls, part of the large parish of Llanridion, and a popular meeting place, especially the Greyhound Inn, where not far away in a field can be found a few standing stones. We've now caught up with our northern part of Gower, overlooking the marshes and Barry Estuary, for to continue passing Llanridion School brings us to the village of Llanridion itself. Here we turn eastwards towards Swansea, passing the North Gower PH to eventually arrived at Open Moor, once again at the foot of Kevin Bryn. This little area is known as Kilibian, where the, a sawmill is, is situated, opposite the Kilibian garage. It's now again in operation. On the edge of the common, before arriving at the sawmill, is a building that was once a youth hostel. Now it's a private house, and the only youth hostel left in Gower today is that of Potainon. Opposite this house is a road leading up to Kevin Bryn, and was at one time known to the younger set as the Switchback, where the undulating road proved an exhilarating surface for some of the more adventurous car owners. Recently, however, the surface has been re tarmacadamed and the undulations smoothed out, thus preventing the past occurrences of car sumps taken off at speed. Not far from the road junction at the foot of Kevin Bryn is a large pond known as Broadpool. This pond is approximately three acres in area and was the first local nature reserve to be established by the Glamorgan Naturalists Trust in 1962. The acquisition was realised mainly because of the presence of the locally rare fringed water lily, being indigenous to South East England. This water plant, however, spread rapidly and after a few years covered a large portion of the pool. At the present time, the Glamorgan Nationalist Trust is deliberating ways of controlling this spread with a minimum of disturbance. Several ideas have been put forward, including a trial introduction of those active plant-feeding fish, the Chinese grass carp, or white armors. If approved, this action, I think, will have to be watched closely, as they are known to be selective feeders in colder climates, 
and would possibly only eat the more tender weeds, such as the Canadian pondweed and duckweed. The rougher stems of the fringed lily then might be left as a last resort for food or when the warmer weather is around. The pool itself is approximately four feet deep and its inhabitants include rudd, sticklebacks and the usual amphibious creatures associated with this type of habitat. Example, uh, frog, toad and newt. From Broadpool, passing Calibian, we eventually arrive at a dip and bend in the road where Lethred is situated. On one side of the road is Calibian forestry plantation, while on the other is access to Lethred cave system and the, the start of that fine walk through the Park Mill Valley. Above Lethred is the open common of Penguern, with little access to the little village of Ilston while to continue brings the traveller to yet another dip and bend in the road and Cartersford. The road here passes over the small Ilston stream and many years ago was the, was the site of a toll and nearby a smithy. The large common above Cartersford is Fairwood, the site of Swansea Airport, with Gellihir Woods opposite, another Glamorgan Nationalist Trust local nature reserve of approximately 50 acres. Passing Fairwood Corner is a road junction turning off north which leads to three crosses, while to continue on our main North Gower Road brings us to the meeting place of North and South Gower Roads leading to Upper Killay and the terminus of this particular journey of Gower. Before we leave this part of Gower, however, not far from the junction of these main roads is a relatively unknown area with access situated on the South Gower Road, comprising a large estate with a mansion known as Fairwood Lodge. The grounds are now owned by the University College of Swansea and used as playing fields. Within the grounds is a large freshwater lake where not only a local angling club still retains the fishing rights, but where also students use the lake for boat handling practice, etc. The whole estate can be encircled by taking a narrow lane from the suburban village of Upper Killay and passing through Hen Park, Pulchlefrogger and Black Hills, now a popular restaurant to arrive eventually on the main South Gower Road yet again, opposite Swansea Airport. To continue westward would lead us back into the depths of Gower, while eastward is Upper Killay once more, and the boundary here of this particular encounter with our peninsula.